Welcome again to the Comic Book Historians Podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. Today we're really excited to have illustrator extraordinaire Bill Stout, fantasy and dinosaur illustrator, theme park designer, comic artist, movie storyboard artist, production design artist, the list goes on and on. Bill, thank you for joining us today. Hey, glad to be here. Hi, Bill. You're an L.A. guy originally, correct? Yeah, I was born uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah, on the way to L.A. Oh, I see. My, my parents had, were visiting my dad's family in Idaho, and then they started heading back, and I popped out in Salt Lake City. And then I, I was there for a couple months and then off to L.A. And uh, even though I lived all over the world, I've always kept an L.A. base. I would always maintain an apartment or something, even when I was working in Europe or in Canada or in Mexico. And, and you live in Pasadena now? Yep. Okay. Pasadena, known for its uh, beautiful craftsman architecture. In fact, I, I live in a 1913 craftsman house. Oh, uh, nice. So when, um, where did you go to school uh, here in L.A.? So I grew up in the San Fernando Valley uh, in a town called Reseda. It's the sure. hottest part of the San Fernando Valley. In fact, one day Reseda was the hottest place in the entire world. Uh, I think it was over 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so I asked my mom for an egg because I'd always heard about it being so hot you could fry an egg on the sidewalk. And so <laughs> I, I fried an egg on the sidewalk. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. I, I charge extra when I have to go to the Van Nuys courthouse. It's it's, it's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, in the fifth grade, well, actually, I was in the very first uh, what they called the gifted program. It was uh, it was an experiment in California schools separating out the the quicker learners. I learned to read when I was about three, and so I was in the gifted program all through elementary school. And uh, one of my favorite teachers was a guy named Elliot Wittenberg. And one day he caught me drawing in class when I should have been listening. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of punishing me, he said, do you have any more drawings like that? And the kid next to me said, oh, you should see it. He's got a whole book full of monsters and dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And he asked me if I'd bring that book in. It was like a little Cub Scout scrapbook that I filled with pictures of, of monsters. And I was just relieved I wasn't in trouble. So I brought it in the next day. And he started to assign me extracurricular uh, work uh, involving drawing. Uh, and he knew I wanted to be a doctor. So he'd, he'd say, Bill, you know, I think our class needs a chart of the human musculature system. Could you draw yeah. that up for us? He's oh, like, wow. Yeah, sure. He'd draw that up. Did the human skeleton, cross-section of the ear, cross-section of the eye. And what I didn't realize is I was teaching myself anatomy. Yeah. And, and – it would have been much easier for him to just punish me. But instead, he made this time investment in me. And, and uh, he's the, it's the reason I dedicated my first book, my dinosaurs book, to him. Wow, that's a oh, great that's story. Great. Without yeah, a you know, a lot of those old, um, those old like, uh, medical textbooks from the 50s, it takes true illustrative art form to put those together. And uh, that's awesome that you basically had a crash course in that. That's awesome. So, so what comics were you reading at this, when you started being able to read, uh, when did you start reading comics and what were they? I started reading comics when I was, I think about eight years old and I was reading uh, Classics Illustrated because they were the good, safe comics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I, we spent one year in El Segundo and then moved back to Reseda. I became friends with a guy who had this gigantic trunk full of old comics. And I, I believe it was the trunk that eventually Collector's Bookstore bought and, and started their whole little mini empire. Oh, wow. But uh, he, uh, by then, I was reading Archie comics because I like the humor stuff. And I had another friend who had a big stack of Archie comics, but he liked to read the superhero comics. He liked Superman and the Superman family. And eventually, I sort of slowly started to begin reading those. And then I, I got swept up in the Silver Age stuff with Flash and Green Lantern. I was really affected by Carmen Infantino's work and Gil Kane's work and Murphy Anderson's inking. Uh -huh. And around the time I was 14, I believe, I, I met this guy, Fred Romanek, in an old bookstore. I was going through boxes of old comics. And he said, hey, you like comics? I go, yeah. And uh, he lived a couple blocks away. We went over to his place. And he showed me my first fanzines. I'd never seen a fanzine before. Wow. I think it was Rocket's Blast. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And he proposed we do a fanzine together. When he found out I liked to draw, he liked to draw too. And so we did a, a Mimeo zine called uh, Comics Past, Present, and Future. No. Put it out oh. and sold all 50 copies. What, what, uh, around what year was that, you think, Bill? Oh, that was, let's see. Um, around early 60s. Yeah. Okay. So you were about like maybe 14, 15 years old at the time. Well, like 62, 63, I think. Yeah. That's great. So what, what was the subject of the fan scene? What were you guys uh, uh, talking oh. about? Oh, oh, it was stuff like, you know, should Spider-Man join the Fantastic Four? Idiot kid stuff. That's controversial stuff right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, that's great. Now, when did you, did you only later go back and discover EC Comics, or was that something you had, or MAD, or any of that at that time, Well, well there, was a, there was a kid I knew who collected comics at my junior high school, and he asked me if I had any EC. I said, yeah, I've got loads of DC comics. He goes, not, not DC, EC. And I go, what are you talking about? I'd never heard of it. But it, the name stuck in my mind. And then my friend, friend Roman, he, I think he showed me my first EC, and I wasn't impressed. It was uh, the special flying saucer issue of uh, either Weird Science or Weird Fantasy or Weird Science Fantasy. Uh -huh. Sure. And to me, because it was the special flying saucer issue, it was sort of documentary-like. It was almost like a news report. And so I thought, what's the big deal? Yeah. <laughs> you know, later, I, I saw more true ECs, you know, with the twist ends and all that stuff. And, boy, that, that really – Hit me. Fred also showed me my very first piece of original comic book art. He had a page, uh, I think it was a Batman page by Jim Mooney, who was living in L.A. Oh, cool. And I was blown away because, for one, I had no idea they did them so big. I thought they'd do everything actual size. And here are these huge pages. And then uh, the, the slickness, the quality of the inking was just extraordinary. It was the first time I'd ever seen brush inking close up. I think the inking I was doing back then was probably ballpoint pen. And so that, that changed me. And then uh, Julie Schwartz used to give away original art if, right. if he liked your letter. Yes. And Fred wrote a letter to Mystery in Space, and he got the most incredible Adam Strange story I think they ever did together, Infantino and Anderson. And so I got to see those originals, and that really blew me away. He sent the whole story. Wow. Yeah, the whole story. And that was a story that took up, I believe it took up the entire book. And it had a, a one page that was an absolute classic, which was Alana, Adam Strange's girlfriend, full figure, dripping wet. Wow, beautiful stuff. That's, that's just yeah. amazing. It is. Um, so at what point did you, start, did you start thinking, maybe this is something I'd be interested in doing? Uh, that wasn't until my very last semester of high school. I was a science and math major all through school. I was definitely intent on being a doctor, uh, but uh, uh, which is about 45 minutes north of L.A. And the school system there was horrible. I wasn't learning anything. In fact, uh, they, they had mandatory school spirit. You had to attend the pep rallies. Well, I would ditch the pep rallies and go to the library and try to teach myself because I knew I wasn't getting taught anything in my classes. Uh, but it was sort of like Sisyphus trying to roll that boulder up the hill. Yeah. And so, and so my last semester, I decided, well, you know, you're going to graduate. You're going to be two years behind everyone else in college. Uh, you better think about doing something else. And I thought, well, I've always liked to draw. So I changed my uh, major to art. And then uh, my family was dirt, dirt poor. Uh, there was no way they could even send me to a community college. But fortunately, I, I got perfect scores on my SATs. And because of my financial condition and the perfect scores on the SATs, the state of California gave me a full scholarship to, for four years to any university I wanted to go to in the United States. Mm -hmm. And my friends thought I was wow. nuts. You could go to Harvard. You could go to Yale. You picked an art school? Are you out of your mind? Well, I went, I went to California Institute of the Arts, CalArts, uh, which I think at that time was probably the best art school in the country. Yeah. The head of the music department was Ravi Shankar. The head of the fashion department was Edith Head, who wow. won more Oscars than any other costume designer in history. Yeah, sure. Uh, the head of the illustration department was Hal Kramer. He was the very first president of the Society of Illustrators. 
the head of the animation department. Well, the animation department was being taught by Disney's nine old men. Oh my God, you, you couldn't find a, a better education. And yeah. so I, I was really lucky I benefited from that. It was my first time on my own. Uh, yeah. I lived briefly with my dad. My parents had gotten divorced. I lived briefly with my dad, but quickly, I, uh, with my summer jobs, I was making enough money to live on my own. So I moved to Hollywood mm -hmm. and began living there and going to school from Hollywood. Um, those nine old men used to make convention appearances toward the end of their lives. I wish I could have yeah. caught that. So those summer jobs you had, that was, that was at Disneyland? So, yeah, I was working in New Orleans Square painting watercolor portraits. Uh, we got paid on commission. So the more portraits you painted, the more money you made. I was doing over 80 portraits a day, just cranking those babies out. <laughs> and uh, it, wow. was, it was a fascinating, fascinating place to be and fascinating and, time. And while you were at Cal Arts, did you have any, any teachers or classmates that, that uh, we would know that are, are, were memorable mentors um, or partners? Let's see. Uh, well, there's the, the folks I just named, plus, let's see, my, my best friend at our school is a guy named Chuck Roblin, who did comics for a while. He did a comic called Tex Benson. Yeah, he turned me on to Heinrich Clay which boy that that was an eye-opener and uh most of the comic stuff they didn't really teach comics at my art school i was i was learning all that stuff on my own mm -hmm. uh, but they had a great policy in the illustration department i was an illustration major the policy was that if you got any real work on the outside you could turn it in in lieu of your homework and my last year and a half of art school everything I was turning in was a real job so it made the transition from academia to the real world absolutely seamless it was just great mm -hmm. and were you still reading mainstream comics or had you shifted your attention to underground mm -hmm. things and, and stuff like that let's see um, in oh gosh around 1969 or no no it was around 1971 I had been doing a lot of artwork for uh, a band, uh, this guy who managed different bands. And he also uh, coordinated festivals and uh, built stages for rock festivals. And I, I did a lot of freebie stuff for him. And he wanted to pay me back somehow. So one night he came over with a f his fellow, introduced me. He said this guy was producing a gigantic rock and roll festival, a five-day festival in Louisiana. And so they were there to determine what my job would be at that festival. Mm -hmm. And so they fired up a, a huge fat doobie, and about 10 minutes later, uh, my friend said, I know, we need a guy to sit on stage and draw the rock stars while they're performing. Can you do that? I go, I can do that. <laughs> and so that, that was my job. Nice. And uh, it was, they wanted to do another Woodstock, and eventually, you know, the gates came crashing down, the fences came down, it turned into a free festival. But it was one of those festivals where it was 24-7. There was not a time when there wasn't somebody on stage. They played all through the night, all through the day. And I got to meet a lot of fantastic musicians. And it was an extraordinary experience. And then I hitchhiked back home from uh, Louisiana up to St. Louis, Missouri, and then St. Louis to L.A. Wow. Well, that, that's kind of the rock and roll version of a chord illustrator right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was cool. All right, so then you were talking about the uh, fanzine that you did when you were younger, and before yep. uh, 71, where, which is where we were kind of at, you also did a pulp magazine cover called Coven in 1968. How did that come about? Oh, yeah. There was, uh, they, we had a job bulletin board at art school, and one day there was this posting uh, looking for an artist to uh, do uh, horror, the fantastic witches, werewolves, vampires, and stuff, and I thought, whoa. Uh, they're having a contest to do the first cover for this magazine called Coven 13. Uh -huh. And so I submitted three pieces, and one of them was chosen as to be the cover. So I, their editorial offices were just two blocks from my school. Oh, cool. So I, I walked over to uh, deliver the painting to be shot, and I said, uh, who have you got doing the interiors? They said, oh, our art director is doing the interior. And I said, oh, can I see them? Well, the art was horrible. I mean, you know, it looked like, you know, elementary school drawings. It was just awful. I said, how about if I do the interior illustrations too? So I did the covers and all the interiors for the first four issues of the magazine. Oh, nice. You did quite a bit of interiors. And it was for 
uh, for four issues. That that's a lot, and that sounds like it was a natural extension of just your location in the school and the bulletin boards. That's my location, the school, my passions, my interests, and then that affected me in an interesting way. And in that uh, when I was doing watercolor portraits at Disneyland, I had samples on my easel. It, it was. Uh, each artist did his own samples. It was to so the public could say, "Oh, I, I want that artist, or I like that artist style." And so I was working on a portrait, and I hear a voice behind me reading the signature on my portrait. She goes, "Stout, huh? By any chance, are you the the stout that does the illustrations for Coven 13? And I was sort of shocked to be recognized. I turned around, and it was a teenage Scott Shaw. And oh, wow. Scott said, "Wow, Scott said, would you like to be a guest at a comic book convention in San Diego?" Uh huh. I go, "Sure." And so that's how I went to the very first Comic Con. I'm yeah. one of five people that's been to every single Comic Con. Oh, that's awesome. So now, um, now around the same time, 1971, um, one of your main mentors in life, you would uh, you would meet him and assist him, Russ Manning, on the Tarzan of the right. Apes strip. So how did that come about? How'd you meet Russ? How'd you get into being trained by him and assisting him? Well, I was uh, a big Edgar Rice Burroughs fan, and I had a subscription to this great fanzine called Herbdom. Herbdom. And I began to submit drawings to Herbdom, and uh, an unpublished Burroughs book was found called I'm a Barbarian. It was the story of Caligula as told by Caligula's personal slave. Mm-hmm. And so I was real excited that there's going to be a new Burroughs book out. And Jeff Jones illustrated it. And uh, I got my copy. And I decided I would do my own version of illustrations. And I did each one in a different style. I did one in the style of Infantino Anderson, one in the style of Rosetta, one in the style of Crankle, one in the style of Wolf. And he was a subscriber to Herbdom. And he saw these, these pictures. And he saw that I was relatively local he lived down in orange county which at that time was not that bad a drive is about a 45 minute drive now it probably take you a couple hours mm -hmm. but uh he called me up and asked if i would uh, meet with him and uh he asked me if i was interested in assisting him i, I was i was he, already a huge manning fan from his uh, uh both his tarzan comics and uh, magnus robot fighter yeah and so i began to drive out i think three or four days a week to Russ's studio down in Orange. And uh, I'd sit with him and I would uh, ink the strips, everything except Tarzan, the figure of Tarzan himself. And I would also uh, color the Sundays. Uh, and then we did uh, three graphic novels together as well. So what sort of uh, uh, techniques did you learn from Russ while you're doing that? When he was in the Navy, he got stayed. That's where he first did Japanese prints. And uh, they've been a, a gigantic influence ever since. Plus, I always loved Russ's work, and uh, he taught me the importance of meeting deadlines. Uh -huh. and, uh, I, I loved the way he would uh, create three dimensions within the strip by where he placed his blacks. Mm. And I just, I learned an enormous amount from him. Plus, he also turned me on to, I, I was saying something about how, how wonderful Bernd Hogarth was, and he stopped me, and he went over to his big flat piles. He started showing me all these incredible how Foster Tarzans and Prince Valiants. And I was like, whoa, wow. totally blown away. Yeah. And so Foster became a gigantic influence. And whenever I get together with Al Williamson, we'd always joke about how in our work, we're always trying to do new breakthroughs and, and uh, do things people have never done. And, and every time we, we did something like that, we'd go back to Foster and Foster had done it in the 30s or the 40s already. I look back on some of those, uh, after I've read all the Foster Prince Valiant stuff, I'm pretty amazed by some of it. It, it feels like cinematography, like when he's getting attacked by pterodactyls, he's hiding under giant ribs. There's some pretty impressive stuff there. Um, yeah, great. So then now, would you consider your relationship with Russ like a friendship or was it more like a boss or was it like a mentor student? It was, it was all of the above. I mean, the, the, actually, the, besides the work, the thing I'm most grateful to to rest for is to showing me how to be a good dad. Mm -hmm. I watched how he interacted with his two kids mm -hmm. and I learned so much about being a good parent from watching Russ. Wow. That's awesome. So he had a good demeanor about him. Oh yeah. Patient demeanor. That's awesome. So then, um, and then you he mentioned. Also, he also had a sort of Albert Schweitzer like quality to him too. And that 
it pained him enormously to harm any living creature. I remember there was, I, I showed up at the studio one day and there's this big line of ants going right across the floor of the studio. And Russ would not spray them, would not do anything. He, he, he literally could not even hurt an ant. Uh -huh. And one time he got termite, termites and it just pained him incredibly to have to kill the termites. Yeah, that's interesting. That so you to insects, which, which is actually, a, that's, that's a huge amount of compassion, I have to admit. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, now, what, now why, why did you end up leaving, Russ? What, what were the circumstances of, uh, of not working for him anymore and then going to your next thing? Well, I got this job working at a rock festival. <laughs> yeah, at the rock festival. There you go. Yeah, and so I was gone for a few weeks, and, you know, I was, I was young and dumb. I just kind of sprang it on Russ that I was leaving for a while, and he was, like, shocked. He's like, well, wait a minute. I'm not going to have an assistant for a couple of weeks? Yeah. And so it started him looking for someone else. But I came back, and I continued to work on it. But by that time, I started doing my own stuff. I was working for Cycle Tunes and Cartoons, doing comic book stories for Peterson Publications. There you go. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then my illustration career started to really hit, and I started doing movie posters. And that was, at that time, that was the biggest money you could make in illustration was movie posters. There you go. And so... I wanted to ask you about your in seventy two you 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 transitioned over to to working with uh with Kurtzman too on Little Annie Fanny is that right right yep so so tell us a little bit about that uh, how that came to be in your relationship with Kurtzman and with Elder sure well I I had become a huge EC fan uh, due to Frank Frazetta. I was collecting every Frazetta comic I could find, and I found out that he did several things for EC, inking uh, Williamson and did a, you know, a story on his own and did the incredible Weird Science Fantasy 29 cover. Mm -hmm. So uh, my goal was to buy every uh, Frazetta comic, and so I got every Frazetta EC. Well, then when I got the Frazetta ECs, wow, look at this great Williamson stuff. So well, now I had to get all the Williamson ECs, and, and that was – taking me, I was acquiring a lot of science fiction ECs, weird science and weird science fantasy and, and weird fantasy. And uh, then I, so I seen all this great Wally Wood stuff. Well, I thought, well, I got to get all the Wally Wood stuff. Well, that, you know, you can see how the collection and expanded to the point where, well, I think I need a dozen more issues and I've got all the EC new trends. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, so one of the latter things to be, that I was turned on to was mad and panic and, wow. and Willie elder stuff. And it's just Willie elder had this incredible ability that is so rare, which is he can do a drawing that will make you laugh. Even if you don't understand the context of the story, it's just yeah. funny art. It's funny anyway. And, yeah. Yeah. It's funny anyway. And so I did a story for cycle tunes that was a tribute to Harvey Kurtzman, Wally Wood and Willie elder called motor psycho. Uh -huh. And when it was published, I sent off copies to all three guys. And I got a letter back from Kurtzman asking me if I would like to come back east and work on Little Annie Fanny with him and Elder. Nice. I was like, Whoa. I just threw the moon. Wow. That was incredible. So that was the first time I ever went to New York. Uh, and uh, it happened to coincide. It was 1972, so it happened to coincide with the very first EC convention. So I got to meet all of my heroes in that one weekend. There you go. That's how you got it. So yeah. speaking of, of your heroes, which ones out of the EC artists, which ones really spoke to you? What were your favorites? Uh, uh, Frazetta, Williamson, Wood, uh, eventually Graham Engels. Graham Engels had this extraordinary ability to even his, his so-called normal people look like there was something wrong with them. <laughs> it, it, just, it just really creep, it sort of gets into your spinal cord, the creepiness of his stuff. It does. Uh, I learned a lot about storytelling from Kriegstein. Um, George Evans became a good friend of mine. Wow. Uh, Williamson and Crinkle were good friends. Uh, uh, oh, Reed Crandall, big uh -huh. influence. Oh, yeah, uh, he's great. I got to meet Reed when he was working in Al Williamson's studio. Al invited me uh, to spend the weekend at his place, and he was sharing the studio with Reed Crandall. So I got to meet Reed Crandall. That was pretty awesome. So this was and all around George, that convention in 72, the EC convention that you met yeah. all these guys? Wow. Yeah. What yeah. about the Davis? Guy, oh, Jack Davis? Jack, 
I came to his stuff uh, later in life. I, I liked his comics, but I wasn't nuts about them. Uh, but when the things that really knocked me out by Davis were, was when he drew the Universal Monsters and yeah. uh, those monster trading cards. Uh-huh. And well, that stuff is just extraordinary. I still got all that stuff. And then I, oh, and his album covers. I thought his album covers were phenomenal. Right. And so I, I was also really impressed by him because I had read that he was making over a million dollars a year. And I thought, that's a worthy goal. Yeah. And nice goal for sure. So, and so my first thought was, okay, how does he do it? Well, one thing, he works really fast. Okay, how can I teach myself to work really fast but maintain a high quality t- of the work? Uh-huh. Work fast without losing the quality. And so that was, became a real goal of mine. And so I, I became a very fast artist. And uh, it, was, it was due to Jack Davis. Yeah, because you can draw an Ankylosaurus in five minutes. So, yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, first thousand are the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's really fascinating all of those ec influences um uh, did you were you into the uh kirkman um uh, uh kurtzman war books too or um the severin oh, yeah. and all of the people that were doing those i i was definitely into uh two-fisted tales and frontline combat yeah uh those had a big influence on me they were the very first war comics that were anti-war they were realistic they did not glorify war and right. that was an extraordinary thing. Plus, it was also happening at the time we were still involved in the Vietnam War, too. Yes. And uh, when I was working for Kurtzman, uh, boy, research became essential. I remember I was working on a little Annie Fanny page that required a fire hydrant. So I just drew a fire hydrant in there. He goes, Bill, how do you know that looks like a real fire hydrant? I go, well, I just kind of remember it. He says, let's go outside. We went outside and we found a real fire hydrant. And I saw everything I had drawn wrong. Yeah. And that became this, this thing with me. I call it the Kurtzman curse. It really yeah. slows me down because I've got to research everything because I can't have anything that's not accurate. Yeah. And, but I think it pays off in the end. You end up with, with stuff that's at a, just a higher level of quality than you would have if you just made everything up. So that attention to like realistic detail comes from Kurtzman and then the push for other mediums and to draw fast comes from Davis, right? These are like various elements uh, that you're absorbing yeah. that's great now was was Kurtzman yeah, was he hard to please no he he was I mean he was really demanding but you know I, I was used to that working with Russ Russ was demanding you know and and it was always uh, for a higher end it was always to do the best possible work right so there's no harm in that now, um, so what, what what was the main function for Kurtzman and Elder that you that you did, and and did it help them save time? What was it a successful assistance that you gave? Okay, so here's the the reason they hired me is is Kurtzman saw that I could duplicate styles, so he figured I could duplicate his and Willie Elder's style. And Hefner was complaining that they weren't producing enough Annie pages uh, each year, and so they. The idea was that I would be slipped in between Kurtzman and Elder. And the, the way it would work is Harvey Kurtzman would write three stories. And, he, he, and then he'd draw them up on eight and a half by 11 sheets uh, and then send them off to Hefner. And Hefner would approve one. And it would come back. And then Harvey would, let's see, he'd begin uh, drawing the pages full size. I, one thing that really shocked me was I hadn't realized how incredibly tight Harvey's pencils were for Annie because I was used to seeing his finished work which seems uh, deceptively simple and this was anything but simple it was really really detailed and uh, he would do that in, in a series of layers until he finally the final layer was the last pencil page then he would give that to me I would make a homemade carbon paper because the carbon paper that you would buy in the art supply stores had a residue in it that we didn't want and so I would just take a soft pencil and take a sheet of paper and cover it with soft pencil. And then I would use that to transfer Harvey's pencils to a, a nice clean sheet of illustration board. And then I would uh, redraw everything that Kurtzman had done and correct any anatomical errors I saw. And then while I was doing that, Kurtzman was taking uh, Xeroxes of the p- the story pages and then he watercolored them. So that gave me my color schemes. And then using those, 
I would start to build up transparent color on the on the penciled art. And when, when I was about half finished, then I would take it over to Willie Elder, and Elder would do the finishes. And when the page was finished, it would go to Kurtzman, and Kurtzman would lay a tissue over it, and he'd make 300 corrections mm. on that one page. Oh, wow. Then I'd wow. go back to Elder. Elder would make the corrections. I'd go back to Kurtzman. Kurtzman would make 150 more corrections. Go back to Elder. Elder make the correction, go back to Kurtzman. Kurtzman make about 50 more corrections. Wow. Elder would do those, and then the, the page was finished, except for going to the letterer. And I, I said, Harvey, <laughs> my God, no one's going to see these little corrections. Why on earth do you do that? He said, if I didn't do it, Hefner would. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. What, what, did you have any interactions with Hefner, and what did they think of about working with Hefner? Well, uh, I met Hefner whenever whenever Harvey would visit in L.A. He'd take me to the mansion, so I, I'd meet Hefner at the mansion. But Hefner, it was frustrating for me because Hefner didn't understand Harvey's sense of humor. Often, Hefner would rewrite Harvey's dialogue because he didn't understand uh, Kurtzman's penchant for uh, catchphrases, and he would replace it with really stupid, dumb dialogue and really kill the humor but Hefner was a frustrated cartoonist, and this was his way of yeah. expressing himself as a cartoonist. Yeah. Uh, Kurtzman really wanted to work in film. And the way that uh, Hefner kept sort of Kurtzman dangling, he kept promising him he could direct a, a little Annie Fanny movie. Every time Hefner, Hef, or Kurtzman was threatening to leave, Hefner would bring that up. Ah, I yeah. never heard that. Had you heard that, Alex? That's interesting. No, uh. and it never, but it never happened. So, obviously. so I was only I was only on the strip for a couple of stories, and uh, Kurtzman took me aside. He says, "Bill, uh, you're too creative for us. You're, we're not we're not getting any speed by having you you work in between us. Uh, you know, because I I <laughs> you know in my my." arrogance i was like adding jokes and eyeball kicks and stuff uh -huh. instead of just doing uh -huh. the job yeah and they, they needed just somebody to do the job and be invisible and, and that that wasn't me yeah 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 but it was a big influence on the work you would do in the future yeah. after leaving that we job were, right oh absolutely and in fact uh i think my first or second day of working with kurtzman harvey said bill you're gonna learn a lot here you may not realize it at the time but years from now it'll bubble up and you go, oh, yeah. And, and boy, was he right. I'm still right. doing stuff now where I go, oh, yeah. I, I and and Alex, I, I, I see some of that influence of the Kurtzman Elder in the, in the book you did with the Leonardo DiCaprio's dad. I feel a yeah. lot of that, but it's like your rock and roll um, essence is in it, obviously, but I can see their influence, I feel. Well, in all those covers that you did shortly after that, the uh, some of the underground stuff, uh, the fear and laughter cover, and uh, weird right. trips, and and different and cocaine comics, you see a lot of that humor and a lot of the uh, uh, um, kind of echoing back to Mad and and to Kurtzman in general. Um, but talk a little bit about that period, what you were doing in terms of the underground comics. Sure. I, I mean, one of the things I really connected with with Kurtzman and Elder is we both have a subversive sense of humor. There you go. And that tends to run through almost everything that I do. Even even some of my Antarctic paintings, I'll put in little things that are just <laughs> shouldn't be there. Uh -huh. So uh, I think it was Jim. It was Jim Evans who. I met him, he was the designer of that rock festival in Louisiana. And then he was the guy who showed me my first Zap comic, my first underground comic. And I think it was, it was the one with Joe Blow, the Robert Crumb story. Yeah. And yeah. it just blew my mind. I read that, I thought, oh my God, comics can do anything now. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Oh, it was wide open. and. It, it was a revelation. It was just absolutely incredible. The stuff that Crumb was doing, Griffin, Robert Williams, all those guys, Spain Rodriguez, just blew me away, and I, I knew I had to be a part of that. And so I started drawing my own underground comics. I was, initially, I did a, a, some stories for Jim Evans, who wanted, 
he was put out an underground comic called Dying Dolphin. But my stuff, it just really didn't fit with the theme of the book. But I kept the pages, and eventually they saw print elsewhere. But, uh, yeah, the undergrounds, that, that really did it for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Uh, before I, we move on to Alex and, and um, talking about some of the rock and roll and heavy metal, uh, I wanted, we were talking about EC artists. There's one that I wanted to ask you about that didn't do very much at EC, but I know he was a, a, a favorite of yours. Uh, what about Alex Toth? Any thoughts? Did you, uh, did you know him? I, I knew Alex really well. Uh, went to his house a lot. I, I was introduced to Alex by Bob Foster, who at that time was probably Alex's best friend. And, uh, in my early days in doing comics, I kept hearing about storytelling, how important that was. And I had no idea what people were talking about. And they kept saying, yeah, the, yeah, one of the best storytellers in the business is Alex Toth. So I just started to buy his stuff and look at it, even though I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, through osmosis, I began to pick up some of his uh, storytelling techniques uh -huh. and stuff. And so he became a really important influence on me, even though, at the time, and when I first discovered him, I had no idea what I was looking at. You know, I was much more impressed by the, the guys with slicker inking styles right. back then. But eventually, uh, Alex's work hit me like a ton of bricks. And that's interesting, the use of, of blacks, because um, Dan Barry with that slick New York line, and you have Alex Toth, which is a little more rugged, but the storytelling and the shading, that Null Sickles influence, it's a really different usage of blacks. That's, so it seems like you, you really keep an eye on that, on the use of blacks. Yeah, and the way he would spot the word balloons, too. That was really yeah. incredible. And the way he would even spot uh, the sound effects. Uh -huh. if, if there was a thrumming engine sound, that would go across, crawl across the bottom of the panel. And yeah. It's just amazing. I learned a lot, a lot from Toth. So then, um, all right, so let's, let's talk a little bit of, uh, now you mentioned Jack Davis, who made a lot of money and was very successful. And one of the things he did was he went beyond comics into other mediums. You, of course, did the same. Tell us how you got into doing the covers for the um, bootleg albums. So there's a, tra a trademark of quality record label. There's some very famous EC style Who covers you did. Tell us how you got involved in that. Sure. Well, I'm a huge music collector. I've got, uh, I think, over 20, 30,000 albums and uh, many thousands of CDs and stuff. And there was uh, uh, Capitol Records in Hollywood on... Uh, the first Sunday of each month had a record swap meet in their parking lot. And uh, people would sell used albums. This is pre-CD, so this was, uh, it was all vinyl and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had a favorite record shop called Record Paradise on Hollywood Boulevard when I was living in Hollywood. I was checking in with them. Uh, and there was this new phenomenon called bootleg record albums. Uh, I think the first one I saw was The Great White Wonder. It was a Bob Dylan bootleg and mm -hmm. then the second one i saw was uh Liber than you'll ever be with rolling stones bootleg and these are these were white album covers with the name of the album stamped in blue up in the corner mm -hmm. so there was no art or anything involved and uh, they, you could buy these on the street from people or you could buy them actually in some of the record shops as well and in fact, Rolling Stone reviewed Liver Than You'll Ever Be uh, because it turned out it was a better live album than the official release by the Stones. It was just <laughs> it was an extraordinary show. Yeah. And back then it was a lot looser. You could go to uh, a concert and bring a Sony tape recorder and tape the entire show if you wanted. You could get right up to the stage, take photographs of the players. Uh, it was a lot looser back then. So I had just been to a Led Zeppelin concert and I saw all these people taping the show. So I knew probably there's going to be a bootleg of that concert. And it was one of the best concerts I'd ever seen. Uh -huh. So I was waiting every day. I'd check in at Record Paradise to see if the bootleg was out yet. And one day I walked in and there it was. And I looked at it and the art was so crappy. <laughs> and out, out loud I said, oh man, the band deserves better than this. I wish somebody would get me to do bootleg record album covers. Yeah. And a guy yeah. tapped me on the shoulder and he said, want to do bootleg record album covers? I go, uh, yeah. He goes, okay, meet me at Selma Las Palmas, Friday night, <laughs> six o'clock, be alone. <laughs> I love the shifty <laughs> stuff, yeah. Yeah, so I thought, well, this is interesting. That's a really yeah. seedy part of Hollywood, really horrible part yeah. of Hollywood. Yeah. So when I, I showed up, I was 
six o'clock Friday, and this coupe drives up with smoked windows, and the passenger window side goes down a crack, and a piece of paper comes out. And I take it, and it says, Rolling Stones, Winter Tour, and there's a list of songs. Uh-huh. And the uh, voice inside says, see you in two weeks. Same time, same place, be alone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So, I, I did my first album cover uh, for them. It was sort of a, a tribute to uh, Robert Crumb's Cheap Thrills. I love the idea of each song having its own illustration and also having uh, caricatures of the band members on the cover as well. Uh-huh. So I, I did that. And eventually the bootleggers got so they could trust me that I could meet them in person and stuff. And uh, their name of their company was Trademark of Quality, TMQ. Yeah. And so I began to hold them to that name. I kept pushing for more and more quality in, in the product that they were producing. Uh, the first bootleg record album covers were printed on eight and a half by 11 sheets and they were slipped in between uh, the, the cover and the shrink wrap. So they weren't actually printed on the boards themselves. Eventually I got them to print the covers on the actual uh, boards of the album c- covers. And then I s- pushed them and got them to do the first uh, color cover, which I think was a Bob Dylan, Melbourne, Australia cover mm-hmm. where Bob's sitting in a kangaroo pouch. And so it just kept expanding. And, and one of my favorite bands in the whole world was the Yardbirds. And yeah. they wanted to do a Yardbirds bootleg. And I found out that Keith Ralph, the lead singer of the Yardbirds, was living just over the hill from me because uh, he's putting together a new band called Armageddon. And so I, somehow I got his, his phone number and called him up and said, look, uh, we're doing a, a two-album bootleg of – really rare Yardbirds material, live recordings, uh, European B-sides, stuff like that. I said, if we paid your rent for this month, would you consent to doing an interview? Uh, Basically, the interview was I would play the album for him, and he would just free associate whatever came to his mind of what was going on when they were doing that back then. Uh And so we did it, and and it was a long interview. It had a first semi-legitimate bootleg album cover. One of the bootleggers was with me, and he took photos of Keith, and those photos appear on the back cover. And then the front cover, I did a a sort of Arthur Rackham-style illustration of the Yardbirds, where each guy was a different bird sitting on branches of a tree. Uh And uh, the Yardbirds had the extraordinary good luck to have as their first lead guitar player, Eric Clapton, their second lead guitar player, Jeff Beck, and their third lead guitar player, Jimmy Page. And I got to see the very last Yardbirds concert. It was in L.A. at the Shrine Exposition Hall. And I got backstage and I got to meet Jimmy Page and Keith Ralph and Chris Dresia and and, uh, Jimmy McCarty. And I found out, uh, Jimmy told me, he says, well, the band's breaking up. I went, no, (laughs) you're my favorite group in the world. You can't do this. Well, you you, uh, Keith and, and Jim McCarty uh, formed a group called uh, Renaissance. And then uh, Jimmy Page, he kept the Yardbirds and they changed into Led Zeppelin. Nice. Yeah, that's right. Uh, one quick question before I go to the next question. Did Graham Ingalls ever say that Arthur Rackham was an influence on him? Um, did, 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 was that, did it ever come up in a conversation? Because I, I, I wonder, right. I've wondered that because there's like some similarities I feel when I look at both of their stuff. Yeah, I've never read that anywhere. If I had, it really would have stuck in my head, too. Yeah, right. Arthur and Edmund Dulac were both huge influences on me. Right. I, right. I still still work in what I call a, a Dulac Rackham style. Oh, that's awesome. So now, um, now to, uh, we were talking a little bit before the show that when you did a, a couple of the fire sign covers, um, that that uh, got you into the more um, legitimate um, album cover work. And one of them had The Next World You're On Your Own, uh, had a big dinosaur right in the middle. Tell us about that uh, about that stage of your life there. And There's about fire sign not- also, because people may not know what that is, yeah. about fire sign sure. theater. Yeah, fire sign theater were four guys, uh, and they made comedy albums. But their comedy albums were like no other comedy albums you've ever heard, in that you could play them over and over and hear new stuff each time. They're really heavily layered with with. Uh, comedy and information sort of I called them an oral version of Kurtzman and Elder's uh, comics in that their Kurtzman and Elder would have what Harvey called eyeball kicks little tiny jokes filtered all throughout in addition to the main story that was being told the fire sign theater did the same thing but orally uh, they had heavily layered uh, sounds and, and 
uh, oh gosh, almost throwaway lines and stuff that you go back later and you listen to it again and oh, it, there's always new stuff to find. So my pal Dave Gibson, he was a comic book dealer and an original art dealer. And uh, he put out the very first uh, spirit reprints. And then he got permission to put out uh, a collection of a fire sign theater fanzine called uh, the Mixville Rocket. It was something that they produced for their local neighborhood. And so I did the cover for that. And the guy saw the cover and it so reflected the kind of humor that they were doing, they started wanting me to do their album covers. <clears throat> so the first album cover I, I did for them was uh, In the Next World You're On Your Own. Now, I was fighting Columbia, though. Columbia, uh, their record label, did not want to have me do a cover. For one, they had never heard of me. I was a total unknown to them. Mm -hmm. They didn't know if I could meet deadlines. They didn't know if I knew anything about the proper way to design an album cover. Uh, but after I turned in in the next world, you're on your own, they were so delighted. They began to give me lots and lots of work. And so that was my introduction and breakthrough in, into the legitimate record album world. So in the next world you're on your own, I designed it so it had two front covers. So no matter which way it was in the bin, you were looking at a front cover, and the record company loved that. And plus, they they were delighted that I was smart enough to know always put all your information, the title of the album, and who does the album at the very top, because these records are in bins, and as people are flipping through, the only thing they can see is the very top. Mm -hmm. And so I I had already done that. So they were relieved and uh, began a great relationship with uh, Columbia CBS. And then um, from uh, 75 to 77, you were art director for a rock and roll magazine named Bomp. Did that, is this all kind of part of the same uh, involvement in the, in the music world? Is it just kind of grows into this? Well, that was sort of an outgrowth of the bootlegs. Uh, Greg Shaw okay. uh, was the original publisher, editor, and magazine in a way that was more contemporary, was hipper. Uh, more visual and so he contacted me we had worked together he had supplied me with some of the rare records for like uh, who's who which was a, a double album of the who uh, with really rare b-sides and singles and stuff like that in fact uh, John Entwistle saw a copy of that album hadn't realized how much unreleased who stuff there was and he put out a legitimate version called odds and sods and then when they did the CD version of Odds and Saws, the Who contacted me to license one of my Who bootleg record album covers as the picture disc for the CD. Oh. So that's pretty awesome. That is. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Oh, the other thing with the fire sign is uh, I did my very first movie with them. They did an album called Everything You Know Is Wrong. Uh -huh. And they decided to make a film out of it. And so it was sort of the reverse. Usually you shoot the film and then you dub everything later. They already had the soundtrack. So we just mimed to the, the soundtrack. And I, I uh, built the props for the film and was an extra in uh, a party scene. And that was my first intro into uh, filmmaking. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, and then one more question before Jim does the next section. So how did you go about contributing to Heavy Metal Magazine um, in the, in, around this time, um, uh, late, mid to late 70s? Hmm. Uh, my regular publisher, Byron Price, had uh, commissioned me to do a story for the illustrated Harlan Ellison. Yeah. And I did a story called Shatter Like a Glass Goblin. Sure. And uh, to promote the book, the illustrated Harlan Ellison, uh, Byron licensed my story to heavy metal. And so that, that may be one of the first, if not the first, American contributor to heavy metal. I was getting heavy metal in its original form, uh, Metal Hurlant, uh, yeah. the French magazine. And so I was really super well aware of all the, what the European cartoonists were doing because I, I had a monthly subscription to that magazine. Oh, that's great. Who were some of the European? I know, I know you're a Mobius fan, uh, Gerard fan, but who else were you yeah, but, really interested in in that period? Oh gosh, um, in that period, uh, oh uh, Victor De La Fuente, uh, oh, yeah. he did Matador and and some other stuff, uh, and he turned out to be a close friend of Williamson's. And then when I was in Spain working on Conan the Barbarian uh, in Madrid. Uh, every Friday, six o'clock, all the local comic book artists would get together at, at Totem, a uh, local comic book shop, and the owner would 
lock the doors and we just hang out and, and chat and stuff for about an hour. And then we go down the street a block to where there was a cafe where the owner was nuts about comics and he'd have a big table for us. And he'd serve us free hors d'oeuvres and drinks all night long. And it was absolutely incredible. But there I got to meet Carlos Jimenez, who oh. I, I consider the Spanish Eisner. I yeah. mean, this guy is he's, he's great. The stuff is so compelling that I took, uh, I had a book called Paracuellos and another one called Barrio. And I translated them word by word because the images were so compelling. I had to know what the story was. But Carlos, amazing, amazing artist. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, I should also mention Richard Corbin, gigantic oh, yeah. influence. And, and one of the guys, he probably had the greatest technical knowledge of, of any comic book artist working in the business. He bought his own machine to make his own color separations, which is enormously expensive. Wow. Uh, oh, no. but, but that way he was able to doctor the coloring at the most intense color, uh, which is what he wanted for his comics. Oh, I see. And so, I see. yeah, uh, I met Richard. I had a funny experience meeting Richard. Uh, there was a guy working on Conan the Barbarian before I was working on Conan named Bob Greenberg. And he called me up. He says, Bill, uh, Dino De La just hired Richard Corbin to do the storyboards for Conan. Uh, and they put me in charge of showing him a good time and entertaining him while he's in L.A. Uh, could we come over to your studio? I go, Richard Corbin, my studio? Hell yeah. <laughs> Bring that guy over here. I want to meet this guy. And so he, he brought Richard over. And, and I began to pull every rabbit out of every hat. I, hey, check this out. This is a, a Peruvian mummy head I've got. Here's an Egyptian mummy hand I've got. <laughs> Here's, and rich words, if, if I could get more than two words out in a row out of him, uh, I was being really successful. He was just sort of standing there while I'm showing him all this stuff. He's, he's got a big smile on his face. He's got his hands in his pockets and he's sort of rocking back and forth on his heels. Uh -huh. And after about two hours, I, I ran out of stuff to show him and I thought, well, I, I guess we just didn't connect because he, he never said anything <laughs> and stuff, and they took off. Two months later, I pick up the latest issue of Creepy Magazine, and uh, there's this uh, mummy story by Corbin in it. And Corbin wrote a little intro. He said, I, I was recently hired to storyboard Conan the Barbarian movie. Uh, it didn't work out. And in fact, I had an incredibly miserable time in Los Angeles, except for when I got taken to Bill Stout's studio, that was the best day of my life. That was absolutely, <laughs> oh my God, I was so much fun. He showed me all this really cool stuff and he showed me this, this mummy head and that's why I created this mummy story. Yeah. <laughs> it was wow. like, wow. I could have knocked wow. me over with a feather. I had no idea. <laughs> that's funny. I guess he contained it um, and expressed yeah. it on paper, yeah. I remember asking him, I said, do you ever use your wife as a model? He goes, nope, tits too small. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely known his art, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about um, uh, your your work with uh, Ralph Bakshi. You did the uh, the poster for Wizards. Did you do anything else with that or just, just the poster? Well, at the time I was working for this little ad agency in the West Los Angeles part of L.A., and they called me up. They said, we got something different for you this time. It's a movie poster for an animated feature. I said, oh, great. Uh, you're going to show me the film? They said, no, you'll do a nicer poster if you don't see the movie. Uh -huh. And I okay. thought, well, that doesn't speak well of this film. But anyway, I, I came <laughs> in and picked up the job. And I think I did 12 roughs. And they picked one. And, that, and I went to finish on that. And that became the poster for the film. And then four days before the release of the film, I got a panicked call from the ad agency. They said, uh, um, the, the studio thinks your poster's too scary. It's going to scare kids and they're not going to come see the movie. Uh -huh. I said, kids love scary. What are you talking about? Kids I think scary is great. They go, no, no, you, you, you got to redo the poster. I go, the film's coming out four days from now. What do you mean redo the poster? I said, we have a printer waiting for you. <laughs> All you got to do is do the new art and get it over to that printer. And I said, I'll do it today. I made all the changes and stuff. Uh, I took the skulls and bones out and the flies and I replaced it with mushrooms and, and uh, flowers and stuff <laughs> like that. You sweetened it up a little bit. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, they actually, I, I finished it that day, got it over the printer, and they had that in the theaters uh, 
for the release of the film. Nice. Did you go see the film after that? I've never seen the film. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You were curious it's about it. That's, people, that's fascinating. It's a lot of people's favorite film. It's also a lot of people's most hated film. <laughs> but as, as I age and as I grow, I, the people who hate that film have sort of disappeared. And there's a whole batch of people who are, are just nuts about that movie. Mm -hmm. You never met Bakshi? I didn't meet Ralph until after the poster was published. And then he wanted to meet the guy who did the poster. So I drove over to his studio. And uh, that was the first time I met Ralph. Ah, what, what did you think of him? He's a character, bigger than life yeah. character. I had a lot of friends who, who had worked for Ralph, and they had some pretty wild tales about the guy. Out of curiosity, is it uh, that you didn't see it because you felt like there's a lot of Wallywood and Von Bode influence, but they weren't credited? Or is that like, was there some reason that you, you still haven't seen it to this day? I'm not a huge fan of Bakshi's films. Okay. I saw Fritz the Cat, I saw Heavy Traffic, I saw a few other. I, I hated Lord of the Rings. Yeah. There was two hours of talking heads. It was just, and so uh, uh, so many people have warned me against seeing Wizards. I thought, well, I, Ralph gave me a copy. I've got it on Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just haven't had the interest. The interest, lack of interest. Okay. So now, um, how did you, and this is a little bit more of some musical stuff, how did you come about designing the original Rhino Records label in 1978? Yeah. I, I think it was like a local free paper. There's an article written on the Yardbirds by Harold Bronson. Mm -hmm. And I knew of a Fred Bronson who was involved in, in comics fandom and stuff, and I got them mixed up. I, I, I thought Harold was Fred. And so I wrote this really nice letter praising the, the Yardbirds article that Harold had written. And uh, Harold wanted to meet me. And uh, we met. He was working. He was going to UCLA, and he was working as a clerk at a shop called Rhino Records in Westwood, uh, along with his pal uh, Richard Foos. And Harold and I hit it off because we were both big Yardbirds fans. And then I got a call from him a, a few months later. He, they thought it would be a great idea to m see what would happen if they made one of their own records. Yeah. So there was this street character named Wild Man Fisher, and uh, he was hustle you on the streets of Hollywood. He'd say, sing your song for a dime. And if uh -huh. you paid him a 10 cents, he'd make up a song on the spot for you. Well, they got Wild Man Fisher in the back room of Rhino Records with recording uh, machines, and he spontaneously come up, came up with a song called Come to Rhino Records. Yeah, And I think he did another song that ended up on the B-side. Harold calls me up and says, we're going to put out our first record and, and see what happens. Uh, but we need a, an image for the label. Can, it's called Rhino Records. Can you do us a, a label drawing? And so I created Rocky Rhino. Uh, okay. And so that was on the very first Rhino record. To their amazement, that record sold out. So they did another one. They thought, oh, this is this is." Uh, they put together a group called the Temple City Kazoo Orchestra, and they did Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love all on kazoos. They put that out. That sold out. Nice. And that was the launch, the seeds, very seeds of Rhino Records, which uh, became the best re-release company in the world. Yeah. And uh, eventually, uh, Harold and Richard quit Rhino the Records the shop because they were having – and, you know, went full time with the record company, and eventually Richard bought his old record shop that he used to work at, mm -hmm. and then had me redesign it. Oh, nice! Yeah. So now you did the poster for Rock and Roll High School with the Ramones in 1979, and the Ramones yeah. themselves were big comic fans. Were they involved in the idea of you doing the poster? Uh, had did they give you feedback on the poster? How did that come about? That came about because let's see. I, w I was doing movie posters. That was my main main gig back then. And boy, I'm trying to think if Rock and Roll High School is my first. I think Rock and Roll High School is probably my first poster for Roger Corman. Mm -hmm. okay. And I loved working for Roger because uh, typically when the agency I did the most posters for was Steinerger and Associates, Tony Steinerger. And typically when I'd work for Tony, uh, a film would come in and I'd do a couple dozen roughs and then I'd do a few comps, 
black and white comps. Then I do a color comp. So by the time I finally got to the final poster, I'd drawn it about 40 times. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing that the public is going to see. That's, that's where all your energy and juice has to go into. And, and it was really difficult to not be burnt out from all the redrawing and everything. Well, Roger Corman didn't want to pay for all those refs and stuff. I could show him a sketch in my sketchbook, and he'd say, oh, Bill, go to finish. And it was great. So I could put all my energy into the finished art without having to redraw it 20 times. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm not sure why they chose me for Rock and Roll High School. Maybe they had seen my Firesign Theater stuff. Mm. I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I got the call and uh, I showed Roger my rough and he, he said, go to finish. And at the time, uh, the film was being edited by Joe Dante and the film's director, Alan Arkish, at uh, a little street that was just a few blocks from my apartment. So I, I came in to see them and to get photographs of all the people in the film because I wanted to put them in the poster. And walking into that room was like, walking in on two kids who had just been given the keys. They always go to Tumi on the Moviola, working in the film business and, ma and making movies and stuff. So I picked up a whole bunch of reference photos from them and then uh, did the poster. Uh, Roger did give me one instruction. He said, Bill, you can do anything you want as long as it looks like Animal House. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I drew it in Rick Marvin's style. You know, it, it looks basically like the poster for animal house uh -huh. and uh, and they're still <laughs> making the film while i was doing the poster and stuff well it turns out that my favorite taco and burrito place was also the favorite taco and burrito place of the ramon so i'd run into them all the time whenever i go to have lunch or dinner oh and so so i met the met the guys that way and i, and I told them yeah i'm doing the cover for your or doing the poster for your movie and stuff and uh -huh. they're they're fine mm -hmm. they're cool That's guys awesome. mm -hmm. So now, um, you also did the Beatles songs cover for Rhino Records in 1982. And there was some flack you got, or rather Rhino got, because Mark David Chapman appeared on the cover. Um, tell us a little bit about, about that. Sure. I got a call from Rhino Records. They wanted to put out an album called Beatles songs. Now, these weren't songs by the Beatles. These were songs about the Beatles. Yeah. Like Ringo for President, or We Love You Beatles, or Yes We Do, that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I was trying to come up with an idea for the cover, and I thought, I know, I'll do like a cross section of a Beatlemania convention, you know, and show the guy who won the Ringo Look Like contest, uh, avaricious dealers, and everything I could think of that would be at a Beatlemania convention. I thought, well, it wouldn't be complete unless I actually included the one guy who collected one of the Beatles. So I included Mark David Chapman on the cover. Right. And Rhino didn't catch that, and they put the album out, and it started this outrage uh, yes. record shops were returning the, the boxes unopened. Uh, Rhino got death threats. I got death threats. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up on the front page of the LA times. We ended up in people magazine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My whole thinking back then was, you know, fans, they take this stuff way too seriously. And the guy who took it most more seriously than any other was Mark David Chapman. Yeah, And so, so I saw the cover as a sort of a cautionary tale. Don't become this. Yeah. And I, I later heard that Yoko Ono saw a copy of the album cover. This was after John had been assassinated, obviously. Yeah. And uh, she started laughing. She said, oh, John would have loved this. This is his sense of humor. That's awesome. That's yeah, great. Well, it's, a, it's his killer yeah. on, the, on the cover, but in, in a dark sort of comedy. I could, I could see John liking it from various documentaries I've seen with him. Yeah. Was Rhino I, mad I at to... you for it? Were they mad at you for, for doing it? <laughs> <laughs> they, well, they have a sense of humor. They were shocked. They were upset that they couldn't sell albums, and they, they tried putting it out with a plain brown, plain brown rapper cover. Uh, that didn't work. <laughs> Uh, they finally released it with, they took my cover off and released it with a shot of uh, a collection of Beatles memorabilia. Oh. But I knew, I knew as soon as they said, okay, we're going to pull all the albums and replace them. I started buying up, I bought boxes of those because I knew it would be a collector's item. Mm -hmm. And uh, I easily get 250 bucks a cover now. Oh, so, nice. 
the, oh, that's the Beatles great. song. So you still I've have some. Them. Oh yeah. All right, well, uh, audience, you know, if you need a copy, you got to contact Bill Stout. <laughs> he will sell sell them to uh, sell one for two fifty each. So, I, I might want one of those. <laughs> yeah, I might want one actually too. Yep. <laughs> I, I think it's one of my best covers, actually. I, I love it. It, it. It's a really good cover. Yeah. Um, so let's let's get away from music for a little bit and go to uh, your your film uh, and television stuff. You you opened up your own production design studio. Um, uh, about what time was that uh, here in Los Angeles? I was a huge Conan the Barbarian fan, mm -hmm. and uh, my friend Bob Greenberg was working there, and he said, man, you got to see what Ron Cobb is doing on Conan. Now, I knew Ron Cobb as a political cartoonist. He did political cartoons that were originally printed in the LA Free Press, and then they got distributed to all the underground newspapers in America. And that blew my mind that he was actually designing Conan. But I was so busy doing movie posters at the time, there's no way I could get over to the Conan offices. I, I remember I picked up the LA calendar, which is the brand, and uh, it's like, they just, the films just happened to coincidentally all come out at the same time. Mm -hmm. Finally, I got a break in my schedule, uh, but instead of going over to the Conan offices, uh, I went to the ABA, the American Booksellers Association Fair. It's, uh, it used to take place uh, every year, uh, usually alternating between LA, and New York. Uh, that particular year it was in LA and it's every single publisher and every single editor in the United States all in one building. So it's a great place as an illustrator bring my portfolio and go booth to booth to booth and pick up enough work for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. Well I walked in into the ABA and the first person I ran into was Ron Cobb and Ron said look uh, I'm the production designer on Conan the Barbarian you are my first choice of who I want to work with on this film but I have an agreement with the director John Milius he has veto power over anybody I want to bring into the art department I have veto power over anybody he wants to bring into the art department so would you mind stopping in and dropping off your portfolio for for John to see and I said well ah, sounds like fun be interesting learn how movies are made and so I, I came in and Milius happened to be there and he looked through my book and he remembered that heavy metal story I'd done, Shatter Like a Glass Goblin. And he loved that story and uh, the art that, that I did for that. And then there was uh, my, I think my Dragon Slayer's portfolio was in there and he handed it book back to me. And John's a bigger than life dramatic guy. And as he's walking out the door, he turns his head to the side and he goes, hire him. And so I walked <laughs> in to see uh, Buzz Feitchens, our line producer on Conan. And Buzz told me what I'd be making on Conan, and I nearly fell off the chair laughing because it was about 10% of what I was making in advertising. But I thought, well, it's just for two weeks. It'll be fun to see how movies are made, so I agreed to do it. Yeah. What I found out later is when you're hired for a film, you're always hired for two weeks. They want to find out if you're an asshole. If you are, once the two weeks is up, they can let you go, and there's no hard feelings. Yeah. But if you work out, then you stay out. Well, my two weeks became two years. I worked on that film for, for two solid years. And uh, that was really my introduction to the film business in a big way. Uh, my receptionist when I started work there was Kathleen Kennedy. Uh -huh. uh, the, oh, the, guy oh, wow. office was, the guy whose office was across the hall from me, who was this uh, young filmmaker named Steven Spielberg. Yeah. And Ron Cobb and I would work on Conan during the day and then run across to Steven's office in the evening and kick around ideas for Steven's next film, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, in my naivete, I thought the business would always be like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then they introduced me to George Lucas because he was a buddy of theirs. And it was this very, very interesting and fascinating situation. And that really launched my film career. And I've since then worked on over 50 films. I yeah. uh, started as a storyboard yeah. artist and eventually became a production designer. Actually became a production designer in a very short amount of time. Uh, it took me two years. Now, when did you do the uh, work on the Buck Rogers show in, in, in relation to this timeline? That was just prior to Conan. That was 1978. And it was originally going to be three uh, two-hour films for Europe. And in the middle of the shooting of it, they decided to make it a, an American television show. And so to me, uh, being called by them, it was just another gig, another freelance gig. And I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. And I remember I, I came in uh, to show my, 
basically I, I'd work at my studio for a week, come in each Friday and show what was being, show what I'd done. And I came in and I, I saw that they had listed my name at the top of this big chart of everyone working on the film as the designer for the film. I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that at all. Uh -huh. And some other jobs came up and I sort of pushed Buck Rogers to the side and then came back uh, instead of the following Friday, two weeks later and stuff. And so I, I was basically showing them I was unreliable and I got fired on the spot. Uh -huh. I think I, I drove home. I, I think I was crying all the way home. Wow. And that taught me, taught me a very valuable lesson early in my career is that if you're working on a film, don't do anything else. You do not have time. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And that, that show ended up running for, for a few seasons, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I designed a lot of the insignias and costumes and a lot of different things for that. And what did you do on the uh, on uh, Thriller? On Thriller, uh, John Landis called me. He wanted me to do a storyboard Thriller. And I was, I don't know what I was working on. It might have been Godzilla. Uh, but I said, you know, John, I can't do it, but I've got the perfect guy for you. And so I had the, my phone over to Dave Stevens, who I was sharing a studio with. So Dave got the gig uh, storyboarding thriller. And then because of that, uh, Dave developed a, a great relationship with Michael Jackson. Michael wanted him to design everything. Now, did you, um, was Stevens working for you for your at your studio, or were you just sharing space with him? Uh, he, Dave was doing a lot of freelance stuff. He created the Rocketeer while he was at my studio. And then when I was made the production designer on Godzilla, I hired Dave and Doug Wildey to do storyboards for me. You later worked for Jackson um, in part designing some of the, uh, some of the amusement park at his, at his, uh, at his ranch. Is that right? Oh, I designed, I designed the gates to Neverland. The sort of Peter Pan themed uh, wrought iron silhouettes. Did you know Jackson? Nope, never, never met the guy. But uh, we kept almost crossing paths because we both collect great illustrated books from the early part of the 20th century, Arthur Rackham, Edmund Dulac, Dutmold, stuff like that. And one of the shops that I primarily got my books uh, was a place called Cherokee Books on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, comic fans would know that place because upstairs is where Bert Bloom had a, a sort of a comic book shop. And that's, that's where a lot of us would get our uh, old and rare comics. Mm -hmm. But uh, downstairs, his brother Gene, he ran the, the regular bookshop, and he had some great old illustrator books. And I remember walking in one day, and Gene said, man, the weirdest guy was just in here. He says, I almost threw him out. He said he, he had, a, he had a, on a big, long raincoat and a big slouch hat, and he had uh, a disguise with a big nose and sort of Groucho Marx eyebrows and horn rim glasses and, and big, huge buck teeth. And he looked like some homeless guy, and I was about to toss him out, and he said, Gene, Gene, it's me. It's Michael. It was Michael Jackson in disguise. <laughs> oh, wow. In there to buy illustrated books. Yeah, but he was disguising himself yeah, the, as far as back then. It looks like. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask uh, one comic about one one aspect about uh, comics again. Um, around was it around this time that you did the uh, some of the Alien World stuff uh, for Bruce Jones for Pacific? Yeah, I think I can't remember the was that early seventies, mid seventies, late seventies. Yeah, I think late seventies, maybe. Yeah. Um, into the yeah, it was it was funny. L.A. wanted to have an underground comic book scene like San Francisco had, mm -hmm. and uh, there were some financial backer guys who decided this was a good idea, and they threw a huge party. And that was where I first met. Well, it was the second time I met Robert Williams, and uh, at one of those parties, we decided okay, we were going to do an underground comic book called Let Sanity Die (LSD). Uh, and uh, each each artist uh, was, each artist was going to have one or two pages, and then the center spread was going to be by Robert Crumb. It was going to be Honey Bunch Kaminsky, uh, naked with her legs spread, and you would lick her crotch, and on her crotch there'd be a dot of paper acid. Uh, and so you'd come uh, on to the LSD and then read the comic. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was the only guy who finished his two pages. No one uh, else did. Uh huh. Yeah. You uh, sailed through the storm. 
But uh, one of the nice things was I, I got to meet Robert Williams. Robert and I became really close. He's still one of my, my dearest friends. And uh, I remember I showed him my Let's Entity Die pages, and he goes, Bill, put too many claws on that T-Rex. They only have two claws on each hand. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, it embarrassed me, but he started me on the path to, you know, if you're going to draw dinosaurs, you better know your stuff. So I started, I joined the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology and, and began to build all my dinosaurs up from the skeleton up and changed my life. Yeah. So now um, you worked on The Hitcher. You mentioned uh, the first Conan movie as well as the second one. Um, Jim already covered uh, Buck Rogers, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Thriller music video. Invaders from Mars, Masters of the Universe. You know, the list goes on, but I loved a lot of these movies um, as a kid. So the first Conan movie, I love the tone of it. It is my favorite one. The second one, although I wasn't into the tone as much, I noticed that the look of it almost seemed more Frazetta-ish as far as some of the designs in there. Were you responsible for uh, some of those designs that had a more of a Frazetta look to it? Yes, on the first Conan film, I was secretly teaching myself Italian because uh -huh. whenever Dino De Laurentiis and his people didn't want anyone to understand what they're saying, they speak Italian. So I wanted to be able to eavesdrop on that. They discovered that. They discovered I was teaching myself Italian, and they thought that was a riot. They thought that was hilarious. But they also thought, oh, this kid's really serious. Yeah. And so they started grooming me to be a production designer without my knowing it. And they gave me, I, I designed about two-thirds of the second Conan film. Yeah, two-thirds so, of the second one, yeah. So I've got a very strong visual influence in, in that movie. Yeah, because I noticed that some of them straight up look like Frazetta um, art in there. And uh, I thought that mm -hmm. was really fascinating because the first one was more of a barbarian feel, but the second one, it actually had some Fra uh, Frazetta aesthetic to it. So that's awesome. That's basically from you then. Yep. And I also, I was the guy who pulled uh, Grace Jones into the film to play Zula. Really? Okay, tell us about yeah. that, because I, I love Grace Jones, especially the 80s Grace Jones, period. So, yeah, I was aware of her music and stuff. Uh, and if you recall, at the time, uh, in, in terms of skin magazines, there was Playboy and Wii, and Playboy owned Wii. And there was Hustler and Chic, and Hustler owned Chic magazine. That was their chic version of Hustler. It was a, a, a high-class skin mag. <laughs> and one issue, they had a, a, this incredible photo spread. It was Grace Jones and a white chick, both topless but in boxing trunks, boxing yeah. in a boxing ring. Uh -huh. And Grace Jones looked so incredibly feral in that and ferocious. My first thought was, she has got to be in a Conan film. Yeah. And she turned out to be terrific. She was really... Boy, really got into the part and was very believable as, as her character. That's amazing that you brought her uh, into that uh, film. That's awesome. Um, so then now, uh, Masters of the Universe. So I'm a big uh, He-Man, Masters of the Universe fan in general. Um, tell us about your work with the Canon Films in the production design for Masters of the Universe. Okay. The first film I worked on for Canon was the remake of Invaders from Mars. It was script by Dan O'Bannon. It was directed by Toby Hooper, the guy who directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. And Canon, boy, that place, that was a, that was a wildcat uh, film company. <laughs> at, at the time I was working for them, I think the greatest number of films any of the big studios had in production was Warner Brothers had six films in production. And Canon had like 80. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, yeah. What I loved about it, it was similar to Roger Corman in that if you had an idea for a film, you were a young filmmaker, you could get an audience with Menachem, the president of the company, and pitch him and get a yes or no on the spot. You yeah. didn't have to go through the whole chain of underlings. You could just talk to the top guy. And if he said yes, you got your chance to make your film. You wouldn't get much money, but you get your shot. You make a movie, yeah. Yeah, I love that about those guys. They're crazy. So, uh, after Invaders from Mars, I, and Invaders from Mars, I designed all the Martian stuff, except for uh, the Supreme Intelligence, which was designed by uh, Stan Winston's crew. Uh, so, but I got hired to storyboard Masters of the Universe. So I, I started doing that. 
And the director, Gary Goddard, he and I just really hit it off. We had a shared passion for comics. He was a huge Jack Kirby fan. Yeah. And so we, we communicated in a shorthand that uh, other people on the film didn't have. If he told me, uh, Bill, this is great. Can you just Kirby it up a little bit? I know exactly what he was talking about. I didn't have to, you know, have him explain that. Yeah, you spoke the same uh, language. Yeah. He had the opposite relationship with the production designer on the film, Jeff Kirkland. Jeff was this old English guy, and boy, he and Gary did not see eye to eye. On One day, he was taking all the Mattel people, Mattel brass, through the studio where we were working, showing them all the progress on the motion picture. Yeah. And he saved the art department for last, because he knew that would be the frosting on the cake. And those guys just started flipping out. They were just so excited and so impressed. And Gary finishes off this incredible uh, sort of performance presentation, and he turns to Jeffrey Kirkland for uh, a, a sort of an agreement or acknowledgement. And Jeff's working at his board. He, he lifts up his head, he looks at Gary, and looks at the Mattel guys, and he says, it's not going to be too fucking awful. <laughs> a lot of Boom. man burst that balloon yeah and about a week later uh i don't know if it was mutually agreed but anyway jeff left the film he recommended i take over as production designer yeah and and it was funny because i was told at 10 a.m that i was the new production designer and by noon i was getting congratulatory calls from all over the industry Wow. And they knew about it. Before my own family even knew about it. It was like, you know, it's such a small type business. It's yeah. just, it's amazing. So I became the production designer of Masters of the Universe. It so happened that my pal Mobius was living in Santa Monica at the time, trying to get a film project of his off the ground. So I was able to hire Jean to work for me on Masters. And that, that turned out great. And uh, that was perhaps the easiest film that I ever worked on because the production was so screwed up, there's no way I could be late on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so you were always ahead of the curve. Yeah, trying, trying. You had mentioned Roger Corman a few minutes ago. I, I wanted to go back to, to your, your relationship with him and your work with him. I, I've met yeah. Roger before he came to my class and spoke. He was incredibly generous to my students and, and very kind. Uh, what, was, what was it like and what were the projects you did with him? Well, Roger bought my first screenplay. Uh, it was a screenplay called King of Dark Planet. And I remember it was a sword and sorcery film. My first choice uh, for the lead was David Carradine. And David indeed got cast as the lead in the film. And But uh, that came about because I, I saw an ad of, of someone looking uh, for some screenwriting uh, experience. Uh, he wanted to hire a screenwriter and... Sword, for a sword and sorcery film and I called the guy up his name was John Broderick and John said are you familiar with gore and now I thought he meant g-o-r-e like you yeah. know gore. sure no yeah. he was referring referring to g-o-r which was a series of paperbacks by I think the guy's name was John Norman uh -huh. and they're sort of a, a s and m sword and sorcery <laughs> combining <laughs> genres that's great but I did not know that at the time. And I said, I'm very familiar with gore. Yeah. You know, I'm <laughs> a big horror movie fan. So I got together with John, and uh, he started pitching me on this idea of – he didn't actually have an idea. He just wanted to make a sword and sorcery film based on the gore books. Mm -hmm. And so I started uh, doing designs, and then I started asking them about the story. I ended up writing the screenplay. And uh, it was a very painful experience because I, I rewrote it oh, at least eight times. And each time I thought, when I finished, I thought it was perfect. Uh, but John would come through and he'd say, no, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. And he had a lot of experience in the business. But for me, it felt like I was flaying my own skin off my body in writing this. But eventually yeah. I, I wrote it. And then uh, he said he took it over to Roger, but Roger passed on it. And so I forgot about it for a while. At the time I was doing posters for Roger, I called up the art director. I said, I was just keeping in touch uh, to remind him of my existence. And I said, so what's going on there? He says, oh, uh, Roger's producing a film called uh, Cane of Dark Planet. I go, what? 
I, I said, have you got a copy of the screenplay there? He goes, yeah, yeah, actually, I got it. I said, okay, what does the first page say? It says, King of Dark Planet, original screenplay by John Broderick. And I go, and? He, he said, no, there's no and. So what? John has stolen the film from me. Wow. And Rogers, for a decent I had to immediately call my check right away. He took it out of John's pay because John was directing the film down in South America. Uh-huh. And so I got this frantic phone call from South America, from Argentina, from John Broderick saying, what have you done? I go, well, I got the proper credit <laughs> for my writing the film. And I said, how could you do that? He says, well, it, it's easier to sell a film if there's only one name on the screenplay, which is a huge lie. Uh-huh. You know? Wow. So that was the end of my relationship with John, but it was the beginning of my relationship with Roger. Uh, uh, when, when the film was ready to come out, Roger called me in. He said, I'd like to show you the poster. Oh, great. So I, I come in and there's a poster and it's David Carradine, you know, and a sexy woman and stuff. And, and uh, Roger changed the name to from King of Dark Planet to Warrior and the Sorceress. Uh -huh. And I said, uh, Roger, it looks great, but there's no sorceress in the movie. And Roger says, Bill, you've got to understand, by changing the title to War in the Sorceress, it allows us to put a sexy woman on the poster. Yeah, it does. That will really draw, draw, draw in moviegoers. Once we have their money, who cares <laughs> if there's a sorceress in the movie? That's hilarious. Yeah. Package it just right. Maybe. And so so, and so what I else did, did you do with Corman? I did the poster for Up From the Depths. I did the poster for uh, oh, uh, Lady in Red, John Sayles' movie. Oh, uh, with sure. Robert, Robert Conrad as Dillinger and Pamela Sue Martin as the Lady in Red. And then, uh, then I fell into doing stuff with the Dale Arrhenius family and Conan and all that stuff. And many years later, I saw that Roger was being uh, presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award. So I thought, you know what? Uh, I think I was at Monster Palooza at the time. I said, I'm going to try to dash across town and just show my support for Roger. And so I did. I made it there on Tungle Film. I worked on since working for him. He'd been keeping track of my career the entire time. I said, Roger, <laughs> you're, you're wasting your time. There's, there's better things to do than to watch what I'm doing. Oh, that sounds like him, though. Um, yeah. What about Jim Henson? What was your um, – I know you – the the uh, the – never made dinosaur film uh what uh, right. did you work with him did you know him directly uh what happened was uh that lee stanson his daughter she wanted to make a mini series on cope and marsh two famous paleontologists who had a, a battle between each other over their lives and so she was trying to get her father interested in producing it so they went on vacation to the bahamas and uh Basically, their, uh, Jim's idea was to, he said, before I, I invest in this Copen Marsh movie, I, I want to do my third, uh, what he called uh, his, his realistic Muppet films. He had done uh, Dark Crystal and he had done Labyrinth. And he was looking for a third project. Okay. And he said, I think doing a, a project, an entire film with dinosaurs would be great. So they brought a whole bunch of dinosaur books with them. And he said, and then the research we do on the dinosaurs, uh, whatever we discover, that can be applied to your Cope and Marsh story. So they're going through books. They're on the beach. And uh, their maid brings them their lunch on a tray. And she looks at what they're doing. And she goes, oh, you think those are dinosaur books? I'll show you a dinosaur book. And she comes back and she hands them my book, uh, Dinosaurs, a Fantastic View of a Not Lost Era. She goes, this is a dinosaur book. And they started looking at it, and they were amazed by the fact that, that I, it wasn't like any of their other dinosaur books. They weren't just portraits of dinosaurs. They showed dinosaurs living and breathing and, and doing stuff and, yeah. and everything. And then they looked at my bio in the back of the book. They, they said, oh, my God, and he works in film. So Jim told Lisa, as soon as you get back to L.A., you contact him, and uh, we'll start making our dinosaur film together. So... Uh, they got back to L.A., and uh, Lisa set up a meeting between him, between her father and her. And I, I came in, and basically the end result of the meeting is we should really do a dinosaur movie together. Well, we had two more meetings like that, and I could see nothing was being done. So for the uh, 
third or fourth meeting, I brought in a treatment that I'd written, basically the plot and story of the film. They read it, they, and I began uh, designing the dinosaur. At that time, uh, they discovered that Lucas and Spielberg were making Land Before Time, which is actually taken from my children's book, The Little Blue Brontosaurus. Mm. And they lied to uh, Henson and told him they would have their film out a year before his. So Jim didn't want to look like he was copying Lucas and Spielberg with the dinosaur film. So he, our dinosaur project is back on again. I'll talk to you in a few days. And uh, two days later, he died. He killed it because of a competing project, but then when it was about to go back on, he passed away. Wow, that's crazy. So I want to throw out a few other films that you, you worked on, and I want to know what you did on it and, and any, any stories you have in relation. Um, um, uh, Men in Black, uh, The Muppets, Wizard of Oz, Pan's Labyrinth, uh, Prestige, and The Mist. I, I know with some you designed characters and, and different, or some others you might have done something else. If you could just kind of yeah. run through those a little bit. Yeah, don't forget Predator. Yes. Predator, I love that. So Predator, I was called in by Rick Baker. Uh, all my early friends in the movie business were all makeup guys, Rick Baker, Rob Bottin. We just hit it off. Uh, so Rick called me in. I was excited because this was my first big studio film. I'd been doing indie stuff prior to that. And I had a meeting with uh, John Vallone, the production designer, and with um, oh, the director of the film. Uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, uh, they sent me the script. I'd read the script. Uh, John McTiernan, director of the film. Yeah. I'd read the script. I said, you know, this is incredible. You're going to get two audiences here. And the director said, what do you mean? He says, oh, well, you're going to get the action-adventure crowd. But, uh, but the ending, the ending is incredible. Uh, with that ending, you're going to get a whole nother audience. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, the ending. You know, Arnold kills the predator, and he's looking at the, the carcass of the predator, and he's looking at it, and looking at it, he gets closer and closer, and he reaches down, and he opens it up, and inside is this tiny, frail little alien. I said, what a cool commentary on man as a hunter who has to load himself up with all this technology and things to go big game hunting and everything. Uh -huh. I think that, that's just a fantastic ending. And McTiernan looked at that and he opened a script. He reread it and he tore those pages out right in front of me. I said, John, what are you doing? He says, well, we can't have that ending. That would mean Arnold beat up a wimp. Yeah. That's wow. yeah. That From that 80s that uh, macho perspective, I, that makes sense. Yeah. So I ruined the ending of that film. <laughs> uh, in, on Men in Black, uh, ILM uh, had spent nine months on the big creature at the end of the film, uh, the creature they called Edgar. It's sort of like a praying mass cockroach kind of thing that Vincent D'Onofrio turns into. Right. They finished uh, all the animation and everything and then showed it to Spielberg, and Spielberg said, hmm, not scary enough. And they freaked out because they had spent all this time and now they're running out of time. And one of the guys there said, he really loves stout stuff. Call stout. Well, I was working for Spielberg at the time, designing a, a series of uh, arcades called Gameworks. And I get a call from ILM and they describe the problem they're having. They said, could you redesign the creature at the end of the film, but not too much? Just make them scarier because we don't want to start from scratch. And I started doing sketches while I was on the phone. And uh, the next day, I, I faxed them uh, drawings, I redesigns of the creature and stuff, and uh, they went with it. All right, so um, okay, so uh, name another one. Of these uh, let's see, Muppets Wizard of Oz. Uh, Muppets Wizard of Oz was directed by a friend of mine, Kurt Thatcher, who also is a collector of my work, and uh, great screenplay. Uh, both Kirk and I really wanted this to be a theatrical release, but uh, they insisted on it being uh, a made-for-TV movie. But uh, I'm a huge Oz fan. I've got all the original illustrated Oz books. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about Oz a little bit later as, as well. Yeah. Um, I, uh, so it was fun. It was fun to take those Muppet characters and cast them as the uh, Wizard of Oz characters. And uh, what about Del Toro? And um, it was, was Pan's Labyrinth the, uh, the only thing you did with him? Yeah, that was the only film I've made with him. The way that came about was uh, Guillermo and I have all these 
friends in common. And they all kept saying the same thing. Bill, you got to meet Guillermo. You too. You'll sure. hit it off like two people in a pod. But we kept missing each other. Well, Frank Darabont is another collector, a friend of mine. He's a film director who directed Shawshank Redemption. And every year at Comic-Con, uh, Frank would host a, a big dinner for all his favorite artists and occasionally include a couple film directors. And one year, uh, he hosted the dinner and he sat me opposite Guillermo. So that's when I first got to meet Guillermo. Uh -huh. Guillermo came by my booth the next day and he bought a couple of uh, pieces of mine. And he said, uh, would you mind delivering these to my home? I've got something I'd like to talk to you about. So I said, sure, I don't mind at all. So I, I drove over to his house and he, he showed me his spectacular collection, which I'm sure probably just a fraction of that collection because I, I saw the, the gigantic show of his collection at uh, the LA County Museum of Art and it was unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, he's, he starts to tell me about the story that he wants to make as a film and it's, it's, it's the story of Pan's Labyrinth. And he would like me to work as a designer on the, the creatures. And in the middle of this, he gets a phone call. And he says, oh, excuse me, I, I have to take this call. And, and I hear his end of it, which is, oh, hello. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. That, that's really incredible. Oh, I, I feel so honored. But <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to have to pass on your offer. I need to make my little Spanish film now. And he hung up. And I go, Guillermo, what was all that about? He said, oh, that was Warner Brothers. They just offered me Harry Potter. <laughs> Wow. And I went, oh, my God. My esteem for him just shot sky high. What, that this guy blew off the Harry Potter franchise to make his little Spanish film told me so much about who he was as a filmmaker. Yeah. And so uh, I and ended up. And he made up, one uh, of maybe his best film with that. So it was, it was the right decision. On, yeah. Oh, man. Unless you like money, I suppose. Decision. Yeah. And, and we were just hoping beyond hope that, Oh, please just let it get one Oscar nomination for best foreign film. Well, I got four nominations and won two Oscars. So yeah. we were really willed and excited for Guillermo. Yeah, it, was a good, it sounds like it was the right decision. And um, also uh, Prestige. Prestige, uh, that was an interesting I gig. It was a Christopher Nolan film and yeah. about two rival magicians who descend into insanity in, in their feud, uh, played by Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale. And so uh, he wanted uh, late turn of the century or 1900 style uh, magic posters for use in the film, not actually to promote the film, but for use in the film. There was a scene that was cut from the film where one of the magicians is at the printers and they're pulling the, the prints off the lithography stones and holding them up and showing their poster for their next uh, uh, event. Uh -huh. So I did uh, three fake. 1900 style movie posters and nolan said he wanted the posters also to reflect the magician's descent into insanity so the first one i did is hugh jackman and there's all these little uh frisky mischievous devils around him and stuff and it's very sort of light and but look also looking of the time and then the the final poster i did of christian bale is is uh bale is looking up into the universe and there's a bad omen of a shooting star and the, there's a gigantic skull in the in space behind that wow so, so that's what happened with those and what about let's see uh uh the mist oh the mist uh that was made by frank durban yeah who uh, with thomas jane as this movie poster artist who is actually if you look at the movie posters he's working on they're all drawn by drew struzan who is the movie poster artist uh, of our generation. And so it was a, a chance to work with Frank. And uh, the first day I just, I did a bunch of designs of the monsters based upon the short story that Stephen King had written and uh, sent those over to Frank. And the next day I got diagnosed with prostate cancer. Oh. And so that meant, uh, sorry, I, you know, I, I couldn't stay on the film. Yeah. But uh, they pretty much made those big spiders almost exactly like my design, so I can I can see my influence in the the, the creatures there in the mist. And what about what about dinosaur in two thousand? That was a funny situation in that I was approached originally in nineteen eighty nine. I got sent a script by Disney, and I read it, 
and it was it was all about dinosaurs and but something bothered me and i realized oh my god this i think this is the script to the paul verhoeven uh uh film that uh oh he was making with uh oh who's the star wars animator <laughs> well it'll it'll come to me anyway uh and so I thought this is someone else's project and I didn't, I'm not the kind of guy who steals projects from my friends or from other people that I know and, and admire. So I, I immediately called up the animator and I said, look, I got sent this script by Disney and I explained what was going on. He says, yeah, that's our movie. But uh, we came up with a budget of 80, $80 million to make the film. And Disney said, no way would we spend $80 million on a dinosaur film. So we've dropped out. And so he said, uh, go ahead and do the film with, with uh, our permission. And oh, so okay. it sounded like they wanted me to start on the following Monday, but then Monday I didn't hear anything from them. And then I didn't hear anything for a year. Huh. A year later, uh, Disney contacts me. We've got this film we think you'd be perfect for. And they sent me the script. It was the same script. They did this to me every year for about eight years. Huh. And to the point where I'm just like, yeah, yeah, it's the same, yeah, yeah. And then one year they said, no, we're really gonna make it this time. We're really, really, really gonna make it. Uh, we're having the uh, attorneys work on the, your contracts and stuff okay, as, as we're speaking right now. And we really want you on this film. And again, they made it sound like I was gonna start Monday and then didn't hear anything from them. And about two months later, I get a call from one of their attorneys. He says, look, we're really, we want you on this film. We're trying to get you, uh, on this film, but uh, there's a problem that you you insist on working at home, which I had never insisted on. I said, well, I can work at the studio. And they said, you can work at the studio? That's great. We're going to push this right through. Nine months later, <laughs> still not working on the film, I get a call from a different Disney attorney. He said, I just want to let you know, we're, we're really close to having you on this movie. And I said, well, just, just to you know alleviate your concerns, uh, I'll be happy to work at the studio. And they go, work at the studio. Oh my God, the unions, unions would kill us. Can you work at home? I go, I can work at home. <laughs> Great. We're going to push this right through. So finally it, it did become real and it, it became a situation where I worked at home. I would do, uh, design the, the characters and I bring them in every Friday and show the progress on what I'd done on the film. And, uh, the first problem that they gave me is, and I, I really like difficult problems. And this was a good one. It was, they said, Bill, we've got a whole family of iguanodons in this movie and they've got to be really distinctive characters. But to us, all iguanodons look alike. Can you design these so that they're accurate, but at the same time distinctive so that the public immediately knows who's who? I said, I think I could do that. So I, I did. And, and they were so pleased with that. They had me design the rest of the characters in the film. So were you, were you pleased with the film? Uh, yes and no. Uh, originally when I started working on the film, I was working with Tom Enriquez, a really incredible talented artist, and we were determined that there was going to be no talking in the film. No talking dinosaurs, no talking lemurs, none of that. So we wanted to tell the entire story visually. And uh, I remember when I saw Jurassic Park and the first time you saw that big vista with the dinosaurs, my first impulse was, hey, just drop me off. I was done with your movie hour and a half. With the dinosaurs. did the first five minutes of the film as an experiment to show that we could tell the entire story visually and that was also the first uh, promotional trailer for the film and then uh i disney had me going to different conventions around the country promoting the movie and they gave me two video cassettes one with the five minute intro where the dinosaurs don't talk and then the second uh trailer where the dinosaurs do talk so i'd show the first tape and man you could feel it in the audience people wanted to see that film they wanted to see that film now they were so excited about being dropped into the Cretaceous with these dinosaurs and then I would show them the second videotape and they would lose all interest oh they talk oh. Um, but Eisner insisted that they talk so he was the boss he won out but I, I would still like to make that with no talking mm. but I think the first five minutes one of the best dinosaur films I've ever seen yeah, speaking of dinosaurs, exactly. So you mentioned uh, Byron Price earlier. 
and right. at some points of uh, intersection, because you and Steranko had some contribution toward Raiders of the Lost Ark, you've also both right. worked with Byron, Pi uh, Byron Price. So in 1981, The Dinosaurs, A Fantastic New View of a Lost Era, has been uh, described as a book that started the dinosaur renaissance, the dinosaur appreciation renaissance of, of the modern age. So tell us how that came to be. Um, how impactful was that? Tell us also about your relationship with Byron Price as well. Sure. Yeah, the impact of that was enormous. In fact, uh, if you look on the last page of Jurassic Park, Michael Crichton acknowledges me as an inspiration for the film. So that came about because, let's see, uh, Byron Price was one of my regular publishers, and he was visiting me from New York and he was at my studio. I had just completed a whole series of black and white illustration for my friend Don Glute for inclusion in uh, the Dinosaur Dictionary. Uh, Don had written a book, Dinosaur Dictionary, and since the publication of that book many years later, so many new dinosaurs have been found, Don felt compelled to revise the book, and his goal was to have at least one illustration per listing. Hmm. So I agreed to do four, and that turned into 44. <laughs> and... Byron's visiting me at my students. He said, uh, if you could do your own book on anything, what would you do? And I thought he was just being conversational. I actually, I had no answer for him. And he saw all these dinosaur dictionary illustrations laying around. He said, what would you like to do on a dinosaurs? I said, sure, that'd be fun. Forgot about it. Two months later, I get a phone call from Byron. Hey, we got a book deal. Bantam wants to do your dinosaur book. And suddenly I had this gigantic project dropped in my lap. Now, while I was doing the Dinosaur Dictionary illustrations, I thought, you know, this may be the only picture of this animal that the public ever gets to see, so it had better be accurate. So I joined the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology and began to rely upon the greatest paleontologists in the world as my, the guys who gave me my feedback. This was before faxes, so what I would do is I would uh, make Xeroxes of my pencil drawings and then snail mail them to the paleontologist usually the guy who discovered that creature, and get his or her input, and then it would go back and forth until we were both happy. Mm -hmm. So and one of the reasons I wanted to do the dinosaur book is there was so much new information coming out about dinosaurs that was not getting to the public, that they weren't stupid, that they weren't slow, they were fast, some of them had feathers, uh, they took care of their young. And so I thought it would be a great idea to just combine all that new info into one source, and that was my dinosaur book and from the moment that came out i became the dinosaur man uh, yeah i've been into it ever since yeah because i mean you've depicted dinosaurs in books museums um it, it's actually a whole uh, other career for you and uh, what's interesting is your accuracy and you mentioned earlier that the kurtzman curse of needing to be accurate and it's interesting to apply that to an animal that's not around anymore, so we have to have research. And you're always up to date on all the new research, and it's become actually a, a scientific uh, journey for you as well, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the first museum show I was ever in was called Dinosaurs Past and Present, and I had 11 pieces in that. And I used to be the biggest movie nut you'd never want to meet. I mean, I would see everything. I'd go to film festivals. I'd go to movie marathons where you enter the theater at Friday and don't come out till Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, walking up the sidewalk in Hollywood, and a friend of mine spotted me from his car and pulled over and said, hey, Bill, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm really excited. I'm going to go see this new movie. And he looked at me like I was some kind of schmuck. And he said, really? Movie? Man, two hours in the dark. He says, you could be having your own adventures instead of watching somebody else's. Yeah. And man, it flipped a switch on me. From that moment on, I scheduled an adventure someplace in the world every year. First was uh, Galapagos Islands and Machu Picchu in Peru. And boy, it really feeds me as an artist to have these experiences, to go to different countries and different environments and things. And uh, so I'm trying to remember the, where I was going on this. Let's see. Oh, so one of my adventures, uh, I decided I was going to go to Antarctica. Yes. And I had these big, beautiful photograph books by the greatest photographers in the world. They all said the same thing. Try as they could, they couldn't capture the color of what was down there because of the limitations of the chemicals and emulsions in photography. And I thought, well, I don't have that problem. 
anything I see, I can put down on the paper. So I thought, this sounds like a great place to go for an adventure. So I went on a cruise ship down to Antarctica. Also went all, all over Patagonia as well. And I was not prepared for how spectacular this place was. And I thought, you know, I've got to do something to save and preserve this for my kids and my grandkids. Yeah. And prior to going down there, people say, hey, Bill, where are you going this year? And I'd say Antarctica. And they say, oh, man, why do you want to do that? It's just a bunch of snow and ice. Or, oh, make sure you take a lot of white paint. Right. So, so while I was on this ship, I thought, what can I do to change the public's perception that Antarctica is just a bunch of snow and ice? And I thought, I'll do an exhibition of oil paintings showing the rich diversity of life that I've discovered here in Antarctica and do that as a one-man show and have that travel. The other instigation in this whole thing was I found out that the Antarctic Treaty, which protects Antarctica, was due to expire in 1991. And this was 1989. I thought, boy, if I don't go now, I mean, never get the chance if they don't renew that treaty. The treaty was an outgrowth of the International Geophysical Year, a uh, year of international cooperations among scientists in 1958 and 1959. It was so successful that President Eisenhower did not want to see that spirit disappear, so he extended it by creating the Antarctic Treaty, which states that no country owns Antarctica, all wildlife is protected, there's no commercial exploitation of the continent, no mining, no oil drilling. All information is shared. Even at the height of the Cold War, the Soviets could come to any of our stations and look at what we were doing, we could do the same with them. So it was this little oasis of sanity at the bottom of the world. And so I went down there and I thought, I'll do an exhibition of, of painting of the wildlife of Antarctica and to make sure that every kid drags their parents to see the show, I'm going to make half the show prehistoric Antarctica with dinosaurs. So as soon as I got back to L.A., I flew to uh, Dayton, Ohio, to the Bird Polar Research Center and got a crash course in Antarctic paleontology from uh, Dr. David Elliott. And I began doing the paintings. After the first five paintings were finished, I invited the director of the Natural History Museum of L.A. County to see them. And he looked at them and he said, Bill, you've got your show and we will travel it for you. Yeah. So it traveled for seven years. Uh, it was uh, instrumental in getting the treaty re-signed to protect nice. Antarctica for 50 years. But the unusual thing about that experience was, I, I used to say I, I subscribed to what I call the pinball school of career planning. I bounce here, bounce there, bounce there. I go all over the place. I'm a production designer, art director, illustrator, painter. Well, when I was doing those Antarctic paintings, when I finished, I didn't want to stop. I finally, I had the sense of, you've come home. This is what you were meant to do. And so I decided to continue to paint Antarctica and uh, make a book, which will, when it's finished, will be the first visual history of life in Antarctica from earliest prehistoric times to the present day. About that time, I found out that there was a grant that the National Science Foundation offers called the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program Grant. Every year, they pick one or two artists, writers, and photographers to go down to Antarctica. And so I applied for that grant, and I got the grant for the 1992 and 1993 season. And uh, went down there, and I was living in Antarctica, two months based at uh, McMurdo Station, the largest station in Antarctica, and two months based at Palmer Station, the smallest station in Antarctica. And I took uh, over 12,000 photos and uh, brought back 130 field studies. Wow. And... Uh, Began to con when I got back, I needed to do paintings of Antarctica for the book, and I, I've hit about eighty. I've got twenty to go, but I saved the twenty hardest ones for last. Yeah, wow! And uh, I'm sure you just get faster and better at it each each time. So you're probably challenging yourself just as much each time, and it's probably just evolving as time goes on. Absolutely. And one of the things that's really helping since I, I held on to these last twenty images as my last ones. Prior to that, I I painted. Uh, 12 murals for the San Diego Natural History Museum. Yeah. And uh, th those are really ambitious. They include my largest painting, which is 14 feet by 34 feet. Wow. And it, it depicts the San Diego Bay 2 million years ago during a feeding frenzy. And, uh, boy, that's that's my favorite thing of everything that I do is murals. They're, murals, yeah, because they're so big. It's the, the scope of everything. Yeah. And plus, they're a great artistic legacy. They'll be up long after I'm gone. One of my big heroes is Charles R. Knight, who painted the murals for New York and for Chicago and painted our La Brea Tar Pit mural here. Yeah. And so it's carrying on that, that sort of legacy. Yeah, and it becomes a culture, a culture of that location, too. You become part of that culture. 
Um, yeah. And also, uh, uh, like you said, as far as museums, Smithsonian Institution, the British Museum, Royal Ontario Museum, and the American Museum of Natural History. So you've done, you've had a lot of involvement in this uh, aspect of, of your life, very multidimensional. One more thing on dinosaurs before Jim goes to the, to the close to the final section is uh, Universal was going to do a Jurassic Park uh, animated series in the 1990s. Tell us about that and what happened to it. Yeah, I got a call from Will Minio, who is working for the Universal Cartoon Studios. And he asked me if I would consider uh, designing uh, a primetime animated series uh, for adults uh, based on Jurassic Park. Uh, they, he said they wanted to hire me because I had more of a European comic style and they liked that style. And so I began designing all that stuff. And they sh actually shot a beautiful trailer. It's an incredible trailer. I've got it on, on videotape. Uh, and they went to Steven Spielberg to show him to get his approval. And by that time, Steven been, had been so inundated with Jurassic Park stuff that he was, he was sick of it. And he wouldn't even look at the trailer. And he just said, no, I, I'm not interested in a TV show. Mm -hmm. So that, that killed him. Okay, so um, you had talked uh, just a minute ago about bouncing around in terms of your career and going from one thing to another. Um, I'm going to do the same thing um, for a minute and cover a lot of things that I'm I'm interested in that you've done. Um, you had mentioned Oz, and I'm I'm a big big Oz fan myself. What was the theme park in Kansas City? Oh, man, that was uh, one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. Uh, there was a guy who wanted to build a Wizard of Oz theme park resort in Kansas City. And I got hired by Landmark Entertainment Group to be one of the key designers for the park. I designed uh, the Haunted Forest. I designed, um, let's see, the Witch's Castle. And I designed uh, Munchkin Land. Oh, man, and that sounds great. I remember, great. oh, it was incredible. We had a flying monkeys roller coaster and oh, all kinds of cool stuff. I remember getting up to go to work and, and seeing my two sons. And I said, boys, they're paying me to design Oz. It doesn't get better than that. And it, it really was one of the best gigs of my life. But uh, it turns out that the government and uh, atmosphere in Kansas is incredibly corrupt. And they were the investor. They were bleeding this guy. I call it the death of a thousand cuts. Oh, you need a permit for that. You need a permit for this. You need. They're bleeding the guy dry, to such a point where the governor of Kansas hey, says, "Stop! Lay off this guy. We need this theme park. This will be great." And so they backed off for a while, but then they started coming back in, and finally he ran out of money. Oh, yeah. that's that's just tragic. I, I, do I you know. still have so all the designs? Happened. Although I thought the wisdom of, of having a theme park in tornado country was not real sharp. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you had to have it in Kansas. There's no way to, yeah, to not do that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I designed the thing. Yeah, you enter the park and it's, it's 1900 Kansas. You go through Kansas and then step into the Dorothy Gale's house and uh, you warn that a, a tornado's coming. And the room starts to shake and starts to move and everything, and, and the tornado hits, and you're seeing stuff outside the windows. And finally, the house sits down, and you go out the front door that you came in, and you're in Oz. And what they did is they designed the house so that it could rotate 180 degrees. And so you'd enter in, and during the, the confusion oh. of the earth, you wouldn't, or confusion of the tornado, you wouldn't realize that the house was turning, and suddenly you open the door, and you're in Oz, just the way it happened. That sounds fantastic. Oh, now, it was fun. What a tragedy that it didn't get, uh, it didn't, it never came to fruition. Um, yeah. You, you also did some, you, you did some illustrations for some Oz books too, didn't you? Yes, uh, that was through Byron Price. It was they were officially licensed through the Baum Estate, and I did uh, Trouble Under Oz and the Emerald Wand of Oz. Emerald Wand of Oz is the one I did first. Trouble Under Oz. Uh, it was interesting in that uh, he sent me the manuscript for the first Oz book, and I read it, and I called Byron up immediately. I said, Byron, I'm not going to do this book. This writer does not understand Oz at all. It's, this is one of the worst things I've ever read, and uh, that's it, hung up. 
uh, 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 about a month later, he sends me another manuscript. He, he said, look, we took into consideration everything that you were saying and, and made all the changes you, you were asking for. Please read this. Well, I couldn't believe it was written by the same person. It was fantastic. The rewrite was absolutely incredible. And I found out later it's because it was written by a different person. Ah. <laughs> it, was written, it was written by Sherwood Smith because I, I, Sherwood and I were guests at an Oz convention in, in San Diego. And I approached her about that. I said, you know, I, I didn't know at the time that she hadn't written the first one. I said, I can't believe the difference in quality between the first manuscript and the second one. And she said, that's because I had nothing to do with the first one. Huh. And I said, yeah, when you, your manuscript, you totally got it. You, you understood everything that is Oz. And it was so inspiring. And so, so we did those two books together. And then Byron was sort of operating a, a, a slight pyramid scheme and that he was getting paid money for some projects and then using that money to pay off somebody else. And well, uh, he had been paid for my illustrations for the last Oz book. But instead of writing me a check, he used that money to fund something else. And not long after that, he, he died in a tragic uh, wow. accident. And so I never got paid for the second Oz book. Uh, the publisher wanted me to do a third Oz book, which I was, had been planning to do. I was actually I was going to do it as a tribute to Byron until I, I found out about the financial situation. And uh, the publisher wasn't going to pay me again because they'd already paid me. But I never received the money. I wasn't going to work. Uh, third book without receiving the money for the second one, so we hit sort of a stalemate. Did they do but, the uh, third book with somebody else? No. Okay. It got dropped. Hmm. Now, besides the uh, the the um, Oz Park, what, uh, you you've done designs for other theme parks, uh, including things for for Disney all over the world, right? That's right. I've designed uh, elements of all of Disney's theme parks: Euro Disneyland. Tokyo Disneyland, uh, Anaheim, and Orlando. And are they? Uh, do you approach them differently based upon which location they're in, or is it? Would it be something that could transfer to to any of them? I always let the problem dictate the solution, and so it, it becomes a highly individual thing. Whether that can apply to being moved to other parks is sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. But I always try to solve the problem that's that's given to me in the best possible way. So, what were some of the the were, were these specific attractions at at the parks, or go into a little bit of detail? Sure. Uh, for Euro Disneyland, I did I designed a lot of the uh, Buffalo Bill Wild West show. Ah. Uh, Anaheim, uh, I designed a lot of Toontown. Uh, also, I uh, was the first designer in the Indiana Jones ride. And let's see. Uh, oh, for Orlando, I designed a whole series of uh, clubs. I designed actually a, a major undertaking. It was, uh, it was the first project that Walt Disney Imagineering brought me in on. It was called Disney Island. Basically, their problem was Epcot. And uh, next to Epcot uh, were these two huge hotels, the Dolphin and the Swan. And when the park, when Epcot would close, then the public would go into downtown Orlando and spend their money at clubs and restaurants there. So they said, Bill, design us a place in between the hotels and Epcot that will keep people on property. It's got to have restaurants, it's got to have shops, and it's got to have clubs. And so that was a gigantic project uh, called Disney Island. And I worked on that for about two years. And uh, we had a gigantic presentation for Michael Eisner and for lots of other folks. Uh, uh, I was told later it was the most elaborate presentation they'd ever seen at Walt Disney Imagineering. It had smoke, it had lasers, it had, wow. uh, I recorded a soundtrack to it and everything. It was huge. And and uh, I think I gave that presentation about six or seven times. Uh, one time was just for architects. Uh, Michael Eisner had a, a real thing for architects and he wanted to be close to all the greatest architects in the world. So he had us give the presentation to all these architects one of whom was an uh, architect named John Jurdy, uh, who, oh gosh, he designed uh, that shopping center in, in San Diego. It looks like an M.C. Escher design. Oh, yeah. 
anyway, uh, later I was told uh, that uh, they were not going to do Disney Island uh, for two reasons. It was over budget and no one would ever come to it. And I said, over budget? You never gave me a budget. Give me a budget, I'll work through the budget. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, they, they flew us down to Orlando to tell us all this stuff. And then I dropped a huge bomb. Uh, I said, not only that, I will come in under budget. I will do it, not in five years, I'll do it in two years. I'll make this place in two years. And that totally scared the hell out of them because all their projects were five-year projects. And I saw the way they worked. I saw they, they just padded time and padded time. And I, me being in film, I'm thinking, well, this is inefficient. This is inefficient. Yeah. I know who, who to hire to, to get this done. It'll, it'll cost a third of the price and it'll cost, take a, less than half the time. And so basically they were afraid that I had just shown the emperor has no clothes that they were doing all this stuff and making projects take too long and everything. I would, I would have completely have disrupted their entire system. Yes. Of chicanery. So uh, that was the end of that. You, it, there yeah. was no way. No, they could wasn't quite, they could it wasn't quite the end of that. So, uh, I started working years later. I started working for one of the guys, one of the key guys who had been, who I had hired on for Disney Island. And he now had hired me to do these gaming arcades for Spielberg. And he, he mentioned uh, oh, the big shopping center at, at Universal, City Walk. Sure. And, sure. and he found out I had never been to City Walk. And his jaw just dropped. We're going right now. I go, oh, sure, okay. I, I don't know why we need to do this so urgently. So we went up, hiked up to where City Walk was. And I looked at it and I said, oh, my God. They yeah. built Disney Island. There were all my ideas. Wow! At Universal in City Walk. That's what that's what City Walk is 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 taken from. That's it's, all it's, it's my Disney Island. And I found out. I said, "Who is the architect on this?" They said, "John Jurdy." I said, "I show." I pitched to John Jurdy. Wow! And as soon as the project got canceled, he took it to Universal and built it. Uh -uh. And so it, it was. It was. It was interesting for me because, for one, they built it. They showed it could be done. Yeah. And the universe was way cheaper than Disney, and they still built it. And the other thing was the pace, place was packed. They told me it would never attract anyone, and here it was. It was built, and it was packed full of people. Wow. Oh, so, yeah. It's always, it was always packed. Yeah. And a couple of years after that, the LA Times ran a big article on John Jurdy about what a genius he was, an architectural genius and stuff. And they, they kept mentioning City Walk. And finally, I sat down, I wrote a letter. I said, look, this is the origin of City Walk and sent it in. And the Times published my letter. And then it became this back and forth thing on the front page of the LA Times. Oh, wow. And Disney, at Walt Disney Imagineering, they were taking these articles and they were blowing them up wall size and putting them on the walls in the hallways so people oh. could read these. And half the people were thrilled that they were finally getting for City Walk, and the other half was pissed off. I had the nerve to take credit for a Walt Disney project because I'm not Walt Disney. <laughs> uh huh. So wow. and, it was funny. and City Walk gets copied over and over. I mean, the, its influence yeah. is is not just there, but if you think of the Kodak Center and other things, they incorporate lots of those visuals to to other places here in LA as well. Yeah, that's that's really. Uh, that seems to be a theme that's developing that people yeah. that people rip you off and you don't yeah, get the credit it's for it. Couple, it's happened a few times. Yeah, that's um, the business. Yeah, uh, th that, that's true. Um, I, a couple of other things. Um, you, uh, Richard Matheson is one of my favorite uh, writers, especially his Twilight oh, Zone, but also too. I Am Legend and, and things. Uh, talk about your, yeah. your work with him. Well, uh, Mick Garris is a good friend of mine. He's a film director, but he also is, sure. is a writer. And he had, uh, I believe he just published a book. I was invited to the book party for the publication of this book. And I, and I looked at the roster of uh, writers this publisher had. And I said, wow, you've got some great people here. I said, boy, I wish uh, you'd get me to, you know, illustrate one of your books. You do really nice books. And he said, well, do you like Richard Matheson? I go, I love Richard Matheson. He's one of my favorite right. writers in the world. Right. He's incredible. He says, well, 
nobody knows this, but he wrote a children's book. I went, what? Matheson wrote a kid's book? He goes, yes, the only one he ever wrote. He, he's, he, uh, there's some input by Charles Beaumont, too, in the book. He said, would you like to illustrate that? I go, are you kidding me? I'm starting already. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. It was called Abu and the Seven Marvels. It was an Arabian Nights fantasy. And uh, it, it, God, we won a ton of awards for that book. But the best thing for me was getting to know Richard uh, because we did uh, book signings together. And uh, he's the sweetest, nicest guy. We, we, we would commiserate on all the times that both he and I had been stolen from in Hollywood. And I remember at one of the signings, I said, so Richard, are you getting any uh, people wanting to make this as a film? Make Abu as a movie? He goes, oh my God, I'm getting all kinds of people that really want to make this as a movie. And he said, but I tell him, I'll, I'll sign the rights away under one condition. You have to have William Stout as your production designer. I said, Richard, don't do that. Just take the money. <laughs> I, I, I can't. I, I'm fine with my career. I, I, don't, I appreciate, you know, you saying that, that it's a, it's a wonderful thing, and, and I'm really tickled and honored and stuff. But, you know, just get the damn thing made. Wow. But it, but it never, it's, it's never been made, has it? No, no. Uh -huh. it's, it's a beautiful book. I mean, it, the, the illustrations are just, just lovely to look at. Um, oh, thank you. And you got, you got a lot of accolades for that. I did. That was, yeah, I won gold medals from the Society of Illustrators and all kinds of stuff. Now, you, you also, I mean, we'll go through some of the, the um, people like that that you were lucky enough to work with. Another one, uh, and you've mentioned being friends with them, but you, you did a uh, collaboration with, uh, with Gerard, too, right, with Mobius? Yeah, uh, it was funny. Scott Shaw... Uh, Boy, I guess this was in the early 70s. Uh, he had a friend going to UCLA who had a subscription to a magazine, magazine called Pilot. It was a French comics magazine. Yeah, a lot, yes. And he said, you got to see the stuff they're doing in France. And he brought me over, and I'm looking through these Pilots, and I'm going, oh, my God, the best Western comic ever made is done by a French guy? Yeah. And it was yeah. Lieutenant Rubery yeah. uh, okay. by Jean Giraud. He'd sign his name as Gir on those. And he says, well, if you think that stuff's great, where do you see what he does as a science fiction artist under the name of Mobius? And he showed me that stuff. And I was like, holy cow, this guy is astounding and stuff. So uh, Jean made a trip to California, and I, I think he was staying at Sergio Argonis' house. And Sergio called me up and it, it had me come over and introduced me to Jean. And we just hit it off and became friends. So when I would go to Paris, I would see him. When he'd come to L.A., he'd see He'd see me, and we'd always try to look for ways to work together. And his agent, uh, Jean-Marc Lofissier, I just love this guy because he was the most honest agent I've ever met in my life. And uh, we hit it off because I love talking in business. I don't just have art. My business can be just as creative as art. Yeah. And so I was a skilled negotiator, and so was Jean-Marc. And every time we would break through and, and get a new plateau or a new crest or a new uh, perk, we call the other guy and say, hey, we just got this. And so both of us were amping up our contracts together with, uh, by trading information on what was possible. Yeah, one awesome. thing I didn't get, one thing I didn't get that was really amazing that I'll, I'll never get was uh, Jean was hired uh, to design an entire floor of a place called the Metreon in San Francisco. There's one floor for uh, where the wild things are, Maurice Sendak. One floor is all Dr. Seuss. And I forget who the other floor was, but there's also a whole floor completely designed by Mobius. It was like stepping into Mobius's brain. It was absolutely incredible. And it was all sponsored and paid for by Sony. And Sony, and Jean Marc called me up. He says, Sony was so delighted, so happy with what Jean did. They bought him a Frederick Remington painting. <laughs> Like, oh my wow. God, yeah. that's unbelievable. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Jean-Marc called me one day. He said, we are, Bill, we are putting out uh, these Mobius comics, and we would love to have you involved. And I said, so tell me, tell me about the Mobius comics. He says, well, uh, Jean has done lots of different stories that had never been published. Some of them are just in pencil form. Some are half finished. Uh, 
you get first pick on what to take from Jean and Adapt. And so I found a, an Arzak story he had done, and he, he had uh, penciled, I think, the first couple of pages and then roughed in two more pages and then just lost interest. So I took that, and I finished the story. I made it an eight-pager and, uh, and did it in uh, the sort of Arzak style and stuff. And it ran originally in black and white in Mobius Comics and then in color in heavy metal. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. And then, and then the last one I want to uh, mention is I, I have your 2013 Legions of the Legends of the Blues book, which I, wow. I got in, in at a uh, comic con um, years ago. Yeah. And I, I want to say how much I enjoy that. But now were you, were you looking at it as a sequel to the Robert Crumb um, uh, book that preceded it? Here's how this came about. I, I told you I had prostate cancer. Well, I, had, I had surgery, and I was told it's going to take you two months to recover. And I go, nah, I'll be back on my feet in a week. No, it, it really took two months. But I'm not the kind of guy that can just sit around and not do anything. So I had the Robert Crumb trading cards, and I had all this free time. And so I made a list of everybody that Robert hadn't drawn. And fortunately oh. for me, he hadn't. He hadn't drawn the chess guys, Muddy Waters, Little Walter, Howlin' yeah. Wolf, and he hadn't drawn Robert Johnson. And so I was like, this is great. And so I made a list of 50, and I did 50 portraits that looked like the uh, Chrome trading cards. Just prior to that, I had done a, a gig for Shout Factory. It was 2006 was called the Year of the Blues in America. And so Shout uh -huh. Factory decided to put out these best of collections and they got permission from Robert to use his trading cards as the CD covers. But there are three people he didn't, he hadn't drawn and he didn't want to do any more. So they had me draw them in the same format. And I had so much fun. I continued to work in that format when I was recovering from my surgery. So after I finished the first 50, I, I called up uh, Dennis Kitchen, who's Robert's agent and an old friend of mine and head of Kitchen Sink Enterprises. And he was the original publisher of the trading cards, of Robert's trading cards. And I said, look, uh, what do you think? I told him what I had done. How about putting out a, a set of these as trading cards? And he said, Bill, you notice anything unusual about Robert's choices? I go, yeah, he did the really ancient guys, like Sun House and stuff. He goes, yep, public domain. He uh, says, your stuff is much, your guys are much later. So you're going to have to deal with them or their estates and get their permission, get yeah. approval over the witnesses. And I go, oh, it sounds like a nightmare. Sounds like, I guess I just did these for myself. And Dennis said, well, would you consider the, doing them as a book? I said, wouldn't I run into the same problem? He says, no, a book is not considered exploitation like cards or T-shirts. A book is considered a benefit to the public, so the rules do not apply. Yeah. And uh, so I said, well, Dennis, uh, you're, you're Robert's agent. You were his agent on the, on the collected card book. Uh, how about if you represent me? on? And so he actually got me the same deal with the same publisher. And so we contacted Robert, and Robert said, man, I can't wait to see what you do. So the book acts as a compliment to, to Robert's stuff. And I was having so much fun, I thought, well, I really love the British blues too. So I made a list of a hundred British blues players oh. and I thought, well, I got to have the modern guys too. Paul Butterfield, Mike Bloomfield, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Jack White, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, and yeah. so it, it's planned as a three volume set. And so uh, during this COVID-19 stuff, I've been getting lots of work done in that book mm. on the second book. Uh, Legends of the British blues is, let's see, it's, I've completely written it. I completely penciled it, completely inked it, and I've colored 75 out of the 100 portraits. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've been working on that. And uh, that's, that was such a total joy to research because prior to that, I thought, well, British Blues, I know everything about those guys. I know who the Godfathers were and all this stuff. I was so wrong. I, in my investigation, I found out all kinds of people that I wasn't aware of who were really – uh, key to starting the British blues explosion. So I think it's a book that will surprise a lot of people. There'll be the expected people like the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds and the Animals and Van Morris and stuff, but there's going to be a lot of people in there that will surprise, surprise their readers.
I can't wait for that. We, we're doing, uh, because my seven-year-old uh, is, is at home, we're going through an album each day, and I'm talking about it. And we did uh, we did B.B. King's <laughs> Cook County Jail, and he said it sounded like old people. And so we did Albert King, and he said, I like that a lot better. And then when I uh -huh. got to the White Stripes, he goes, I want to hear that again. And it's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice how, thread. How he's processing it. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. I took my sons to see White Stripes at a tiny club. It was their first uh, gig in L.A., and it was absolutely incredible. Nice. Oh, yeah. No, I'm a huge fan of that. Just great. So one more uh, question um, uh, before we wrap up is, you know, you mentioned the COVID-19, how it's gotten basically forced uh, a lot of people to just stay indoors and work on stuff that's kind of within their personal sphere of space. You're talking about catching up on projects like the blues stuff. Um, how, how do you feel, because you've seen different industries, you've worked in different industries, how, how, will, how do you think this affects the pop culture industries like comics and movies? Will there be an effect, or will everything basically just go back to normal after a while? But what's your prediction on, on all that? Uh, I think nothing will go back to normal. I think it will uh, form a semblance of a new normal. Uh, there's a lot of people because of all the shutdowns are losing their jobs and they will be entering different careers and we're not going to see them uh, again in the film, music, or book publishing business. Uh, the fact that Diamond shut down the distribution of comics hit the comics world really hard. Um, I don't know what the fallout of that is going to be like. Um, it's uh, The streaming of the movies has become very successful and that's scaring the hell out of the theater owners. Right. Um, so there, there's stuff will come back, but it won't come back in the exact same form that it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, so th there's been some um, broadcast from Jeppy that he's going to start renewing some distribution on May 20th. And I think it'll probably just depend on how tight each individual state is as far as what will be distributed. Um, there's right. also, because Walmart's, uh, considered kind of that essential kind of uh, like location as far as groceries, then there's also some comics that are being distributed through Walmart to get to places. So I think mm -hmm. some, some, it'll be interesting to see what happens with distribution and this and how different arms of distribution and then digital comics will things shift to this traditional diamond to Walmart and digital. I, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to find out. Yeah, it is. And it's a really interesting time for comics. I, I consider this, up until the, the advent of the virus, a, a really golden age for comics in that it's wide open now. You can do any subject that you want. You can work in any style that you want. If you want to do a comics that it's all done in pastels, you can do that. You can do oil paintings. You can do as traditional right. pen and ink. There's no that you can write compelling stories about being a hospital filing clerk. Uh, it's it's an amazing era to be experiencing comics right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. As far as artistic and what's possible for sure, because anyone can do anything. That's true. All right. Oh, well, and some of the publishers, like like First Second, um, and and some of the other children, um, the the inroads into children's bookstores and what they're providing in terms of comic creators is just fantastic. I was just reading John J. Moose's. Uh, uh, children's book that he just did and it was like god this is just lovely lovely stuff mm -hmm. and and yeah. you can you can do so much yeah i did a story for my grandson's favorite comic which is spook house that's mm -hmm. put out by eric powell it's scary stories for kids oh sure and so i thought i'd surprise him and, and i i did a three-pager for eric that that ran in uh the second season of uh of Spook House, and that, that was total fun. It's just, there's some great, great, great stuff out there. And then I was at a show, and a, a writer named Franco dropped off some of his books. Incredible comics for kids. So I've been buying all those up for my grandsons. But uh, it's tough now that the local comic shop, well, all the comic shops have been closed in California. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Um, there's something about that experience of going to one. It is a nice feeling um and uh, that I, I for sure missed that already so um all right well then uh 
Well, this has been a really fun uh, podcast uh, at the Comic Book Historians. Thanks so much, Bill. You know, Jim and I are big fans of yours, and it's really impressive. It's almost like you were kind of like that quintessential West Coast person that his mind was open and that you just explored everything that you've uh, that you've just kind of had your mind on artistically. You never held back. You don't have walls. You just kind of keep uh, you're, you're you're continue to be a pioneer artistically. Um, thanks so much for talking with us today. It was it was it was a huge deal yeah, for us. This was a real treat for me. Thank you, Bill. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that <laughs> that diversity it's a, it's a double edged sword. I, I tell my students, I say, look, if you want to become famous, do the same thing over and over and over. Uh, doing what I did, that's the slow path to fame. <laughs> yeah. And it also makes you, it also makes you incredibly hard to collect because you never know where my stuff is going to appear next. It could be an album cover, it could be a book, it could be a film. You never know. Each day is kind of new and exciting. Mm -hmm.